Welcome back guys. This is your friend, Parallel Deku, back with another fanfiction. This is the seventh part of What if Vigilante Deku was adopted by Aizawa? Now before starting, please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Now let's get into the fanfic. The following morning, the school was alight with whispers. Something had happened in Hasu. Someone had died. A pro hero had been killed. It wasn't the first time Izuku had heard the whispers. The hero killer was becoming increasingly infamous as time went on. Izuku felt a sick lurch in his stomach. The villain had killed a Yua graduate, barely two years out of school. Some of the third years knew the hero. Izuku knew her too. He knew that her quirk allowed her to make anything she drew on her body form in the physical world. He knew that the weakness was water as the images could easily be washed away. He knew that she had graduated near the top of her class with full marks on quirk diversity. He knew that she had won her last sports festival. He knew that she aspired to own her own agency one day. Hell, he even knew she shared one of his favorite colors yellow. Izuku knew a lot of wonderful things about her. Izuku also knew that she was well known for sequelly harassing people on the street. Even women could be inappropriately handsy. The problem there was they were often let off the hook since the men were expected to enjoy the touch, not be unnerved by it. When Izuku entered Wana after therapy, the class was already in an uproar, talking about the same news that the whole school had been discussing. It made Izuku nauseous to think about. Good afternoon, Midoriya-kun. Yurarakisen greeted, walking over to his desk with a small hop in her step. I hope you are feeling well today. Yais. I, I'm DD doing F fine. Did you hear about the hero killer? Sarasen asked, sidling over. Izuku mentally pulled Deku aside, not allowing those emotions to take charge. Yais, it's, it's S sad she died. Man, if I could just get my hands on that jerk, Kaminarasen shouted. You'd do what? Shock him enough to lower his ick? Jirosen asked with a sly smile. Kaminarasen sulked at her words but smiled a little afterwards, finding amusement in the roast as well. I just want to know why he's doing it, though. Ashidasen groaned. Probably just for fun. What else would motivate villains? Saracen said. Hey, Midoriya, what are your thoughts? You're like, super smart and stuff, right? I bet you have loads of ideas. Mindtasen asked, bounding up the quiet boy. Izuku froze at being put on the spot. Um, WL. What are you all doing? Class started seven seconds ago. Aizawa sensei said gruffly. The class rushed to their seats. Kirishima raised his hand. Um, sensei. I swear Bakugu was here just a bit ago. But he seems to have disappeared. Bakugu is delivering a letter. Aizawa sensei said. If he has any sense, he'll be back within five minutes. The class quieted, awaiting instruction. Pull out your books. We will be reviewing your training from Monday and Tuesday. Groans sounded, only to be cut off with a single look from the dark-haired man. Considering Aizawa sensei's face was still mostly wrapped in bandages, it was pretty amazing that the students responded too quickly to his stare. Bakugu stormed in around the time everyone had gotten their things settled. He had a two letters in hand as he made his way over to his desk. One of the letters landed in front of Izuku. There. Kakin snarled, sitting in his seat with a huff. Izuku noted the sharply styled form of Kakin's writing and tucked it into his bag to read later. He had a feeling the blonde wouldn't appreciate him looking at it right now. He knew that Shinsu had been made to write an apology letter to the explosive boy and had a feeling that Bakugu's punishment had been similar. Now, would you prefer we start with your strengths or your weaknesses? Aizawa sensei asked the class. Ashidasen raised her hand. Can we possibly talk about the hero killer instead, sensei? Izuku watched as Aizawa's bandaged cheek twitched. No, the man said sharply. But shouldn't we discuss this topic while it's happening? I mean, the dude's on a rampage. Don't you think we should know how to respond if we face him? Sarosen questioned. No, you are students. You will not be facing any form of hero killer anytime soon. Aizawa sensei said. But... Villains attacked us once already. What if the hero killer figured out a way to break into Yua too? 
Deku couldn't stop the snort of laughter from leaving him. As if Stain would attack a group of high schoolers. A few students glanced uncertainly at the boy, and Kakin turned to send a city aid glare. How would you know who he'd attack, Midoriyasen? Asuasen asked. Deku looked at Aizawa sensei nervously. He should really get his mumbling under control. Yes, Midoriyakun, Aizawa sensei. I think this is a very real possibility that we should be prepared for. Idasen said, standing and chopping his arms through the air. You all need to worry about the sports festival this weekend. Aizawa sensei sighed. We will. But how can we focus without a plan of action in case something bad were to happen? Hagakurasen asked. You are the one who says to always be prepared, Aizawa sensei. No kidding, Pictographer wasn't much older than us. Now was she. What if the hero killer decides he doesn't mind killing teens? We are practically sitting ducks. Especially during the sports festival when Yua opens to the public. Kaminarasen added. Enough. Aizawa growled. You want a plan of action? If the hero killer walks anywhere near you, run away. You are untrained, unlicensed, and undisciplined. None of you should be foolish enough to engage. What if it is forced, sensei, like the us, Jay? Yayurazusen asked, worry tinging her voice. Aizawa sensei groaned, sliding his good arm down the front of his face. Why hasn't anyone caught him yet? Ajarazen asked. Is he really that powerful? Aizawa leveled them with a stare before shuffling his papers and placing them back on his bag. Fine, you want a lesson on the hero killer? We will have one. I expect notes on the subject, though. Everyone but Deku moved to begin writing. The hero killer is an open case of violent acts against pro heroes. He has killed at least 13 people and has injured countless more in the last six months. Each killing has only grown more efficient. The police have yet to pinpoint his quirk, only knowing that it paralyzes his victims for a varying amount of time. Any questions so far? Shaojisen raised a hand. With so many left alive, why don't the police know his quirk yet? Does anyone want to attempt to answer the question? Aizawa sensei asked. Yoyorazusen responded. Well, victim statements are faulty at best, especially in reference to quirk-related crimes, since there is such a vast array of options. I don't think he has been caught on tape, either. You are close. Aizawa sensei praised. Anyone else want to add on? Against his better judgment, Izuku raised his hand, giving Deku the stage. Aizawa raised a brow at his participation. According to witness and victim reports, it is possible that victims may be losing consciousness for a period of time once the hero killer attack. Deku said, moth suddenly very dry. Each victim explains a different amount of time that passed while the hero killer toyed with them. He continued, Not only that, but all of the victims spoke to the killer, lost blood to the killer, and made physical and eye contact with the man leading to a variety of possibilities as to how the paralysis initiates. This adds on more variables such as duration for each form of initiation, willpower, presence of thought, order, and so on. The class stared at Deku for a few seconds too long. I knew he was super smart, Mindtassen said. Yes, that is correct, Midoriya, Aizawa sensei drawled. The victims have all been licensed heroes, though age and experience do not seem to influence the hero killer's pick. Overall, the heroes chosen seem random at first glance. What do you mean, at first glance, sensei? Ayama asked, hand high in the air. I read on some forums that he only goes after corrupt heroes. Tis a dark abyss we live in, Takoyami said. Corrupt? How so? Pictographer was strongly out of high school. Yurakasen asked. Aizawa sensei closed his mouth tightly. Heroes did not speak ill of other heroes. It was one part of the system that Izuku despised. She had at least seven sequel harassment charges filed against her, Deku said. And at least five others that have already been dropped. But she's a woman. Kaminarasen said confusedly. Women can be sequely abusive too. Jiru scolded. In fact, they usually get away with it because of how our society views gender roles. So what? He's acting as a vigilante. That's still messed up, bro. Kirishima said, shaking his head. He is not a vigilante. Deku said firmly, drawing eyes back to him. The hero killer Stain is a villain. 
I mean, that's kind of a blurry line, don't you think? Ajarazan commented. He's right, Midoriyasin. Vigilantes are really just villains who claim to be doing the right thing. Yayorzusan added. Or the wrong thing for the right reason. Kuda signed. Vigilantes are people who are trying to help. If they want to help, they should get licensed and do it legally. Kakan said, glaring back at Deku. The green-eyed boy clenched his fists, growing tense. Sometimes, it's better to do things slightly outside the law. Sometimes, it's necessary. Are you saying you support the hero killer? Mindtassen asked, voice high in surprise. Of course not. The hero killer is going out of his way to track down people and end their lives. He is specifically looking to commit violent acts. Vigilantes work to help, above all else. That's not necessarily true. It's not like there is a vigilante oath like there is for heroes and police. They could have any motivation, Jiru said. No kidding. Honestly, if you are going to break the law like that, you probably just want to cause trouble, Ashidasen said. Maybe Stain is a vigilante. Deku stood, anger rolling off of him in waves, as well as a few other emotions. Fear, shame, dread, regret. Enough. Quiet down. Aizawa-sensei called. He eyed Deku until the boy was back in his seat. Legally speaking, vigilantes are individuals that partake in hero and or police work without a license to do so. The hero killer, Stain, has not done any such acts, and is thus a villain no more. The class was silent for a full minute before Ashidasen raised her hand. Sensei, I still don't understand his motivation. The girl said. Even if the heroes are doing bad things, couldn't he find a different way to handle things? Pictographer had lawsuits against her, right? Shouldn't he have waited to see how they turned out? Humans come up with many excuses for their behavior. We could try and guess his true reasoning all day. It's not really that strong. Deku spat, looking up at Aizawa sensei when he felt the man's eyes on him. They seemed to be screaming at him to zip his mouth, but Deku was riled up. Aizawa sensei was practically lying by withholding information. If the class wanted to know motivation, they should have the chance. They would face it in the real world anyway. Why do you think he's doing it then, Midoriya? Kirishimasen whispered, unsure if he actually wanted the answer. I'm not saying I agree, but I can understand the mindset. Deku clarified before speaking. Aizawa sensei was tense at the front of the room, but remained quiet to let Deku speak. Pictographer will never be prosecuted for her action. Deku said slowly, letting the words sink in. She is a woman who is messing with men. That is already a tough case. But to top it off, she is also a pro. What does being a pro have to do with anything? Sarasen asked. Our society sees pro heroes as godlike figures who can do no wrong. If it came between the word of a pro and the word of a civilian, which side do you think you would take? Deku paused, allowing the class to think. Their faces told him what he already knew. But pros are just people. They do bad things, just like everyone else. The problem is that they are held on a pedestal. Pros get in trouble all the time. Kaminarasan said with a wave of his hand. Do they? Yayurazusan said, thinking. I actually can't remember the last time a spotlight pro was punished. Sure, they are taken to court. But they are almost always acquitted. Stain has a philosophy. And I don't actually think it's wrong. Deku said cautiously. I think he goes about fulfilling it wrong but the idea itself. Deku looked out at his classmates. The world is full of fake heroes. Deku said. People who are only in it for fame, money, and other selfish reasons. The moment that a hero sees their work as more of a job, or a way to reach the top, instead of a way to help people, they put one foot on a path towards corruption. You can't think that being a pro for monetary means is bad. It's a job, Midoriya-kun. Yuraraka said her eyes brimming with tears. Stain's philosophy is that true heroes only wish to save people. Deku said. But what about you? Yuraraka questioned. I personally think it's fine to have other goals, but there should be a limit. If you want to be a hero to make money, you need to think about what you would do if you had a choice to make. If it came down to saving a person or saving your paycheck, which would you choose? If you helped someone and it resulted in you losing a major sponsorship, 
Would you hesitate to save the person? Because if you would, I don't think you deserve to be a hero, after all. Helping people should always come first. The other stuff should just be bonuses. But, that's not how society functions anymore. People don't normally do good just to do good. The class stared at Deku in silence. I think that's bullshit. Kakan growled, turning in his seat to look at Deku. You can be a great hero, even if your first priority isn't helping people. We are all human. We all have needs and wants. What's the problem in going after them? You think the doctors of old became doctors just to help? No. They did it for the money. The respect. Saving people's lives was just a bonus. Of course you wouldn't understand. Deku growled. Kakin paused, eyes going wide before narrowing. Of course the first time Deku ever stood up to him was in the middle of class over F-seeking hero philosophy. I'm not the one teetering on the edge of agreeing with a serial killer. The blonde boy hissed. I think it's disgusting how you seem to respect that F-seeker. Deku was surprised that no explosions were popping off with the amount of ire in the boy's eyes. I think it's pitiful that you can't keep an open mind despite a person's actions. Just because he's doing bad things, just because he is a criminal that doesn't mean he is completely bad. People aren't black and white. You want him to run free, don't you? No. I think he deserves to rot in prison for all the people he's killed. Deku said. But I also think we can learn from him. Because Stain has a point. Stop. The quiet word echoed throughout the room despite the lack of volume. All eyes FLC curd back to Aizawa Sensei. This is why I didn't want to discuss this, brats. The man said, sounding exhausted. Talk of villain philosophy always becomes messy. There will always be multiple perspectives among all groups of people. But it can get dangerous. The man paused, making sure the class was listening. Stain is a threat to hero lives, yes. But none of you are heroes, so you have nothing to worry about there. The real threat to you is the message he is spreading. Ideals such as true heroes and false heroes lead to more violent acts when not tempered. When people who take Midoriya's side don't have the state of mind to effectively weigh right and wrong, worldviews become skewed. People become enamored with this sense of justice and ultimately continue the cycle of unlawful acts. Deku looked down at his desk when Aizawa Sensei's gaze landed on him. He suddenly felt like he had messed up somewhere. Stain's philosophy is spreading. Midori approves that. So it's wrong, Deku asked, interrupting the man. Do you think it's wrong to think that heroes should be held to higher standards? Do you think it's wrong to believe that something should be done to temper those who are ultimately causing more harm than good? Aizawa Sensei sighed. No, it's not wrong, and therein lies the problem. The philosophy is a solid stance and holds logical ground. The problem is when you have a charismatic person acting on the philosophy in a violent manner such as with Stain. By committing murder in the name of this philosophy, it inspires others to do the same if they believe in the philosophy too. After all, it makes sense by that point. Humans may see the crimes as necessary evils. And that, that is where the danger lies. The inspiring nature of criminal acts, just as with positive acts, is difficult to break once it starts. Why does Midoriyasen's explanation seem so much more stable than Stain's? Because he puts a limit on his ideation. Aizawa Sensei said. Could the societal philosophy go wrong as well, Karo? Asui questioned. Yes. Todoroki responded, making many in the class jump. The kid strongly spoke, so it was unnerving to hear him chime in. Aizawa Sensei nodded. Todoroki is correct. You can see it in action with the courts going easy on heroes. You can see it in action with heroes going easy on other heroes. Deku added. Don't rat out a fellow comrade and all. Aizawa frowned but nodded. It is ingrained in hero society not to speak ill of other heroes. It is seen as bad taste. I am usually one to agree, unless it becomes absolutely necessary. But others, Aizawa sensei looked at Deku, would disagree. I must warn you all to be careful if you choose to have an outspoken view. However, it could seriously hurt your future prospects. It could cost you your license. Aizawa Sensei glanced at the clock and sighed. That is enough of this conversation. Now, there isn't enough time to review everything from the past few days, 
so I will simply give you a rundown. Please pay attention. With that, Aizawa sensei effectively ended the conversation, restarting class with ease despite the intense unease that was palpable throughout the room. Saturday morning came much too quickly for Izuku. He was up before the sun today, having been unable to sleep more than three hours at a time last night. By Zou 5 Zizer, he had given up and made his way down the stairs. Teachers were already bustling around, preparing for the day to come. Yamade Sensei, who was the main person in charge of the festival, was doling out tasks to all the teachers. Izuku had never seen him in a leadership role such as this and marveled at his efficiency. Aizuwe Sensei was hanging back, drinking his morning coffee silently from the corner, as the other staff hurried in and out of the teacher's dorm, most of them half-dressed. He only spoke when Kame Sensei came running back in, her robe swinging open with her motions. Go put some clothes on, Kayama, he said with a sigh. The woman paused, looking down. Then she smirked. I completely forgot. It's just so comfortable to be in the nude, you know. Aizuwe Sensei didn't grace the woman with an answer. When the bandaged man noticed Izuku, he motioned him forward. Why are you awake already? I see she couldn't as sleep, Izuku said, still watching the organized chaos surrounding him. Aizuwe Sensei groaned, but nodded his head. Go back to your room for a little while and relax. I'll make you some breakfast. Izuku nodded, not daring to pick a fight about food in the middle of this teacher tornado. Izuku wasn't particularly hungry, though. In fact, he felt a little sick to his stomach. Either way, he knew that Aizawa sensei would force the food down his throat, whether he wanted to eat or not. Underscore 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 the kid was sitting at his desk, fiddling with some trinket probably a support item when Aizawa entered. Here, it's Aku. I thought that might be best for your stomach. Aizawa said as he set down the rice porridge. Izuku stared at the food for a minute before picking up the spoon. Th thanks. How? How did you know IFF felt sick? It was written all over your face, brat. Aizawa said as he went over to sit on the edge of the boy's bed. Izuku turned in his chair, taking the bowl with him. I, am I RR really, that easy TTTO read? Aizawa grinned. Most of the time, Izuku shifted in his chair as he bit at his lower lip. So very easy to read. Are you nervous? Aizawa asked calmly. Izuku stilled, looking at the man with a hint of fear. I see can do thdh thighs. I never said you couldn't, Aizawa said. I asked if you were nervous. Izuku nodded once, looking over to the side. It, it's ss stupid. I said shouldn't be nervous. I've ff faced worse. I, I've bb been as stabbed and sh shot and plenty of uther more ss serious things. Th thighs isn't even life th threatening. Aizawa sighed. It's normal, Izuku, he said. This, being nervous over a sports festival, is normal. You are going to be in the spotlight. You are facing off against your classmates. You want to win. All that can lead to you feeling nervous. Izuku nodded hesitantly still looking unsure. I am glad that you are reacting to this like a normal teenager. Aizawa said cautiously. You wouldn't have done this when you first arrived at Yua. It's nice to see that you have adapted. That you are actually enjoying your adolescence. Izuku stilled, spoon full of oku halfway to his mouth. I'm normal. Aizawa didn't really know how to respond to the question. He wasn't even sure if Izuku had taken the word as a compliment or an insult so he remained quiet. I did not think anyone's e ever really ss said that tto me or o about me before, Izuku said after a moment, his spoon settling back into the bowl without him taking a bite. Th thanks, he whispered in the end. Aizawa couldn't stop the slight pull of his lips, relief flooding him now that he knew Izuku had taken the comment well. Sensei, Izuku said, catching Aizawa's eye. Wh what? What if I did not win? What do you mean? Aizawa asked. What if I L lost? W would you be DDD'd? 
Aizawa thought for a while before responding. I will be happy so long as you do your absolute best, he said. Izuku nodded, turning back to his desk and finishing the bowl. When Aizawa went to leave the room, taking the empty bowl with him, Izuku called out to him. Sensei, I, I'm... The boy paused, taking a breath. Watch me, okay? I'll, I'll make you proud. Aizawa turned away from the boy with a nod. I know you will. Underscore 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 is a coup lined up with one C during the beginning ceremony. Yamade Sensei and Aizawa Sensei were up in the commentator's booth, and Kei Mei Sensei stood before them, whip in hand. Each class was lined up, all in the traditional U.S. school uniform. Many of the general studies classes were grumbling at the lackluster introduction of everyone, but the hero course students. Izuku didn't mind much, though. He preferred to be underestimated. Your student representative, Kei Mei Sensei called out, her microphone making her voice echo across the stadium is Bakugu Katsuki, from Class 1A. How the hell is he the student rep? Shinsu muttered under his breath. I think it's whoever scored highest in the entrance exam. No. A girl from 1D said. It's whoever scored highest in the hero course exam. Can't have anyone but the precious hero course students be student rep. Now can they? Izuku shifted nervously, watching as Kaken scaled the stairs onto the stage. With bated breath, Every student waited for his commencing words. The athlete's oath, he started calmly, only to have his face contort into a scowl. Make no mistake about it. Kakin called out among the crowd. I'm gonna take first place over all of you extras. Izuku, Hitoshi, and all of one aside at the declaration. Of course he would say that. Students from other classes yelled out at him, insulting the boy or claiming that they would be the winners. Overconfident jerk. A boy from 1B yelled out. Izuku jolted, taking a look at Kaken before glancing over at Shinsu, who had seemed to agree with the boy from 1B. He's not overconfident, Izuku said quietly to the purple-haired boy. The old Kaken would have smiled when he said that. This one, this one is taking this extremely serious. Old knots of anxiety formed in Izuku's stomach as he spoke these words. This would not be a cakewalk by any means. Now, without any delay, Kayama Sensei said, drawing attention back to he stage. These are the qualifiers. It's in this stage that so many are sent home crying every year. The fateful first event this year is. The screen on stage lit up brightly, showing three simple words. An obstacle course race, Kayama Sensei shouted. After a brief explanation and the call for everyone to take their positions, the lights at the top of the starting gate glowed green the signal to start. Deku darted forward quickly, not wanting to be trampled by the horde of students now following behind. He and Shinsu had agreed to work separately for any non-team events, and thus, Deku felt no qualms in leaving the boy behind. Mummy man, are you ready for our live coverage and commentary? Yamade-sensei's voice called through the speaker. Not voluntarily. aizawa sensei replied, monotone as ever. Deku grinned, but didn't allow the antics of his two guardians distract him. As he darted forward, Deku noticed Todoroki dashing towards the front, a trail of ice spreading behind him, catching students in place. Deku grimaced when the ice nearly caught his own foot. Luckily, he had noticed just in time to jump up, out of reach. From there, Deku used the other students as sounding boards to jump forward. Many from Wana were ahead of him, but Deku was keeping pace pretty well. Falling around 12th place thus far, Deku heard Mike over the intercom and had to laugh as he looked back at the overcrowded gate for a moment. Yamade-sensei called. What is it that should be the first thing contestants should always look out for in a race, he called. The gate. Aizawa-sensei drawled. Obviously. He added on, already sounding done with Yamade-sensei's antics. Deku felt overjoyed at having passed by that obstacle so quickly. It would have sucked to be trapped in such a large crowd. He needed to make sure not to get caught in the pre-made traps. Just then, Mainta, who had been running relatively close to Deku, 
was flung away by a giant, metallic hand. Multiple robots, including zero pointers from the entrance exam, blocked the pathway. Deku cursed at the inconvenience. Every obstacle course needs obstacles, Yamade Sensei's voice called out. Starting with U.S. Specialty First Barrier Robo Inferno, he screamed out. In a matter of a couple seconds, ice formed over the large robots, freezing them in place. Deku rushed forward again, despite their unstable balance. Unlike some of his other classmates, Deku stayed close to the legs of the bot, ensuring that when it fall, it wouldn't crush him. Todoroki had been the one to freeze them, it seemed. Deku marveled at the clever tact of keeping them a barrier for the other contestants. However, the boy seemed to be underestimating the power of many of the other students in his very own class. The current leaders of the pack are overwhelmingly from Class 1A, Yamade Sensei cheered. Deku took note of those around him. Todoroki was in the lead, followed closely by Kakin, Fumikage, Siro, and then himself. Fifth place wasn't terrible, but he needed to make distance between himself and the others before they all got past the robots. Unfortunately, that didn't look to be in the cards as Izuku came upon the second obstacle. So the first barrier was a piece of cake. Yamade Sensei called out over the speakers. How about the second? Fall and you're out. You gotta crawl across if you wanna make it, the man called. The second barrier looked to be a canyon or sorts. Large rock platforms stood tall, separated with reinforced wire. Deku sighed in relief as he looked over at the obstacle. He could do this. He had items to help him through this. Izuku took out a thick baton, taking a running start, and pressed the button. The baton extended, forming a pole that shot Deku through the air and over to a nearby platform. Midoriya, a girl's voice called out. Your baby actually worked. That's wonderful. Deku looked back to find a pink-haired girl jumping excitedly. But that baby is nothing compared to mine, Hatsum called, activating her jet-propelling shoes. She passed by Deku quickly and easily. Deku couldn't help but smile at the girl, though. Those are awesome, he called out to her, receiving a thumbs up as she reached the other side. Deku continued his path, crossing the obstacle with relative ease, up until the very last jump. When he snapped the baton back, his sweaty hands lost their grip. Although Deku was safely across the canyon, his baton had fallen. FCK, that had taken hours to make. Hatsune was still giving off a speech about her babies when Deku landed. He patted her on the shoulder as he passed. Don't stay too long. The real event to show off is the last one, remember? You need to pass the first test too. When Izuku reached the next obstacle, Yamade Sensei was midway through his explanation. A minefield. Of F-seeking course. Todoroki and Kakin were in the lead, neck and neck. Deku had fallen behind to 15th place. He cursed as he thought through his option. It wouldn't be good for him to be caught in an explosion. It could lead to a mental breakdown. He needed to think of another way. Some way that would be fast, but save him from feeling the heat of the explosions. That's when he got an idea. Izuku took out another device and pressed the button. It opened up into a shield. Deku had to use trash can lids plenty of times in battle and had decided to upgrade his equipment to something more sophisticated. This would certainly do the trick. He dug under mines and piled them together carefully before taking a few steps back. With another running leap, he threw his entire weight onto the small pile of explosives, shielded from the heat by his own support item. The shock from the explosion was jarring but Deku was flying through the air at top speed. Despite the possible whiplash, he was gaining on Todoroki and Kakin with relative ease. A giant explosion from behind. Yamade Sensei called out over the speakers. What could have caused such a blast? Was it an accident, or was it intentional? As Deku soared through the smoke, Yamade Sensei called out once more. It's Midoriya Izuku from Class 1C. He's riding that explosion wave in hot pursuit. As Deku neared the ground, he passed the two in the lead. He laughed happily before letting out a slight yell when he realized his shield was coming away from his body. In a split second decision, he pulled the shield up and around, doing a full somersault in the air to give the support item enough strength to create another major explosion. This one, added with the strength in which Deku had slammed the shield to the ground, broke the support piece into pieces. He should definitely enhance the durability of that thing. 
when he came crashing down to the ground once more. Deku rolled into the landing, stumbling only slightly when he popped back up to continue running. His muscles ached from the dual explosion. His ears rang with the sound, and his head throbbed. But he was in the lead. Midoriya blows off the competition with no time to lose, Yamade-sensei calls. Man, what are we teaching these kids? As Deku ran through the next gate, tense and prepared to face yet another challenge, he heard Yamade-sensei once more. Who could have predicted such an incredible turn of events so early on? The one who made it back to the stadium first was none other than Midoriya Izuku from 1C. At that, Deku jumped in the air with a cry of relieved joy. He came in first. He quirkless, useless. Deku came in first in one of the sports festival activities. Oh my goodness, Midoriya kun that was amazing. Yuraraka said as she ran up to him, out of breath. Th thanks, Izuku said, a big grin still showing on his face. Damn nerd. How, how the FCK, Kakin said as he rounded on Izuku. The green-eyed boy took a few steps back when he noticed Shinsu Rumno, covered in sweat, but a determined and joyous look on his face. He ran over to Izuku as soon as he saw him, cutting off the advancing explosive blonde. Holy sit, you got first place, the boy said through his huffing breath. Izuku, that's amazing, he continued. Izuku flushed, the use of his first name not lost on the boy. At the look, Shinsu flushed as well. Um. I mean, Midoriya. And no, it's okay. You can call me Izuku. The freckled boy said quickly. We are friends, after all, right? Shinsu looked at Izuku in surprise and nodded. Yeah, yeah, we are. He grinned. You, you can call me Hitoshi, too. If, if you want. Izuku flushed a deeper red. It might take some getting used to, but that would be nice. And you can call me, May. Hatsumesen said, appearing from seemingly nowhere. And these are my babies, the girl said, pulling out a few gadgets that Izuku had seen her working on during class. Wanna see how they rock? At that moment, K. Masonsei called the students in the stadium to order. Underscore 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 Aizawa carefully turned his and Izashi's microphones off before turning to his husband. He made it. The words came out monotone. But Hizashi smiled wide, understanding the hint of joy in his husband's words. He made it in first place. Show. Hizashi said with an excited squeal. Think he'll be able to overcome the consequences? Aizawa huffed, looking down at his problem child. Yeah, I think so. Think he could go all the way. Aizawa stayed quiet for a much longer time. I, I hope. But the other students are strong too. Yamada nodded at his husband before turning the mics back on. A cavalry battle. A group-based task. A major issue, if you were the first-place winner of the first task, and given 10 million points, compared to second place, who only got 200. Izuku wanted to throw up at the news of how many points were now on his head. Deku wanted FLCK off whoever thought that would be funny. He had a feeling it was the rat principal who was currently safe in the year 3 arena. Oh, Izuku, Hatsumesen called. Deku flushed at her use of his first name. He hadn't meant for her to start calling him something so friendly. This is perfect, she exclaimed, jumping in place as she struggled to keep herself from hugging the freckled-faced boy. With you in first place and me on your team, my babies will be in the spotlight. This is so exciting. Hatsumesen, Deku said slowly. You, you don't have to team up with me. Whoever is on my team will be targeted. We are way more likely to lose. Nonsense. We made a deal, mister. The girl said, shaking a finger in his face. Me and you would team up, no matter what. I even got you those tools and knives that you asked for. The girl dug around in her back pocket, presenting the tool set and the three knives that Deku had made blueprints of. Those points of yours only make this better. Everyone will be watching our team and thus, my babies. Okay, okay, Deku said with a soft smile. Hatsumesen could be too much sometimes. I'm still with you too. 
Hitoshi said. We already have basic plans and tactics worked out. No point in ruining that work. Right. Deku said. That's three. That should be enough. Midoriya-kun, came a voice from behind. Deku turned to see Yurakasen running up to him again. Do you have any room left on your team? She asked, slightly breathless. Um, yais, Izuku said, surprised out of the Deku persona. Great, can I join? Why? Deku asked, back in place. Everyone will be targeting me. Yuraka tapped her fingers together nervously. Well, um, I just thought, she took a breath. I think that you are really smart and are really good at making plans, and we've already worked well together in the past, and I think that my quirk could be of use to you. She said the extremely long sentence all in one breath before gulping for air. Plus, it's way more fun to do this stuff with friends, right? She said, much more calmly. Deku relaxed and smiled again. Right. Okay? You can join. Deku went on to introduce each of the three students from his three separate classes to each other. The four brainstormed possible ideas up until it was time for the cavalry battle to start. By the bell. The group had a solid plan that might just work. Underscore 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 HN. Aizawa hummed to himself when he noted the groups that had formed. What's up? My sweet roll of toilet paper. Aizawa grunted, glancing over at his husband. You are in a very happy mood. It's annoying. I can't help it. I love the sports festival. Aizawa turned back towards the groups with a small sigh. Izuku. Yamada looked down now, tilting his head. What about him? He's grouped with one person from each of his classes. Yamada looked more closely and then smiled. Ah man. You're right. The blonde man turned to Aizawa, his grin spreading from ear to ear as tears shone in his eyes. He's growing up so fast. He made friends in every class and didn't even need help. Aizawa smiled slightly as well, looking back towards the center of the stadium. Yeah, he's doing well, isn't he? Underscore 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 groups and point values. Midoriya, ten million. Yuraka, one hundred and thirty five. Shinsu. 80. Hatsum. 10. Total. 10,225,000. 150. Shoji. 145. Minta. 125. Total. 420 Yanagi. 85. Kendo. 75. Komori. 45. Takage. 20. Total. 225. Shiozaki. 195. Honuki, 190. Tetsu Tetsu, 165. Asais, 155. Total, 705. Takoyami, 180. Anjuru, 160. Shoda, 50. Ayama, 5. Total, 395. Bondo, 90. Kodai, 60. Fukudashi, 15. Total, 165. Bakugu, 200. Siro, 175. Kirishima, 170. Ashido, 120. Total, 665. Sato, 140. Koda, 115. Jiru, 110. Hagakure, 25. Total, 390. Shishida, 70. Rin, 55. Total, 125. Todoroki, 205. Ida, 185. Yeyurazu, 130. Kaminari, 95. Total, 615. Kaibara, 
105. Chubaraba, 100. Kirwara, 65. Monoma, 35. Total, 305. Kamakiri, 40. Tsunatori, 30. Total, 70 underscore. Underscore 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 Izuku was the writer. Shinsu supported him on the right, and Hatsumesen supported on the left. Yurarakesen helped from the back as she would be the one controlling their direction. Hatsumesen had given Yurarakasen the rocket shoes she had created. The plan was to stay in the air as long as possible with Yuraraka's quirk, using the shoes to guide them in the correct direction as need be, hopefully. That would work, hopefully. At the starting whistle, Hatsum and Shinsu threw two bombs near their group, causing rubble to fly and a smoke screen to fill the air. Deku had made them in support course, and had gotten permission to use them in the festival thank god. The smoke screen bought the group time to get as much ammo as possible. Said ammo, being the rubble the bombs had created. Yuraraka raced around with the group, touching as much as she could and sending the rubble into the air. As the smoke started to clear, she laid a hand on herself and the other three members, sending the entire team up with the defense they had created. Down below was already chaos. Some teams were confused by the sudden explosion, and others had taken advantage of the momentary shock while they stole headbands. It took a solid three minutes before anyone realized that Deku and his team were up above. Good, only twelve minutes left. The first to attack, of course, was from Kakin. The boy had left his team down below, using his explosions to propel himself up into the air. Is leaving your unit allowed? Yamadesensei screeched at seeing Kaken's tactics. Deku would have groaned at his guardian if he weren't currently on defense. Didn't Yamadesensei make the damn rules? Izuku used one of his knives, tied at the end with a durable string, to wrap around a rock and chuck it at the boy. Yuraraka couldn't dispel the antigravity unless everything was to come crashing down, so it was up to other means to use the rocks as projectiles. At the impact from the rock, Kaken fell back being redirected by Saracen's tape so that he could go back to his group. Kayamasensei's voice rang out across the stadium in answer to Yamadesensei's question. It is allowed on a technicality. So long as your feet don't touch the ground, you are good to go. As soon as Kaken got his bearings again, he was up in the sky once more, faster than he had managed previously. Izuku didn't have time to wrap another rock. Not that the same trick would work twice with the explosive blonde. Kaken reached out with a hand, grabbing for the headband on Deku's forehead, only to be kicked down by Shinsu, who was now barely hanging on to the group by a hand. Still technically allowed. Unfortunately, due to his current state of weightlessness, the kick did little more than cause Bakugu to lose focus. As he fell, the explosive teen reached up, managing to grab hold of one of the shoes on Yuraraka's feet. The very shoes that were supposed to allow them to dodge attacks from students such as Todoroki or Shiyazaki. FCK. With a loud crack, the shoe exploded in Kaken's hands before the boy fell away. My baby, Hatsum cried. Inspect the damage. Deku directed though Hatsum was already looking. Blew out the engine. It's fixable, Izuku-kun, Hatsum cheered. Deku once more flinched at his name on her lips, but shook his head. Okay, I'm coming down. Don't let me drift away. Shinsu. You have ammo stored up. In my pockets. Good. You and Hatsum are on guard duty. With that, Deku flipped upside down, his feet now where his head had once been as he studied Hatsum's gadget and went to work. It was dangerous tinkering with machinery, while a person was wearing it power loader sensei must be having a heart attack from his seat. But there wasn't much of a choice at this point. Glancing below, Kaken and Todoroki were currently occupying each other leaving Deku free to do what he needed to do. Yuraraka raised them higher as an added protection, while Deku fiddled with the shoe. Unfortunately, their peace didn't last long as vines shot up and around the group. Deku cursed loud when one of the vines wrapped around his arm pulling him towards the ground. Shinsbu and Yuraraka both kept a tight hold on him. However, 
ultimately leading the entire group down as well. Smoke screen. Midoriya, Shinsu called. Back left pouch. Deku called back, only to feel a hand skin across his lower back and hear the sound of a zipper being open. Deku caught two of the smoke screens that fell from the pouch and Shinsu caught another in his hand. The other five fell down to the ground. At the sudden bright flash and consequent smoke, the vines wrapping the group drew back. Unfortunately, the group was already plummeting to the ground. Deku flipped back up, telling Hatsum to go ahead and flip the switch on the shoes, somewhat easing their landing, but completely destroying the right boot that Bakugu had previously only half destroyed. Now stranded on the ground, Deku and his team could only wait for an attack. They were vulnerable none of them, having overly flashy quirks and very few defensive options, now that they weren't in the air. Keep the rocks floating until we become desperate. Deku gasped once they landed, his shoulders aching from the harsh landing and the whiplash he had from the previous round. Right. Yuraraka said, determination clear in her voice, though she was already sounding nauseous. In the moment that Yuraraka responded, Deku felt a tug at his head as he was pulled back. Moving a hand up, he realized that the headband was gone. Sorry Midoriya, Karo. Came the familiar voice of Asui. She was hidden behind Shoji's arms. Shinsu. Deku said softly. The boy nodded. That was pretty impressive. Shinsu said, as the group ran after Shoji. But now you've become a target. That wasn't very clever of you, was it? Are you crazy? Came Minta's voice from inside Shoji's arms. This is the way of battle. Came Asui's near the same time. Shinsu's nose leaked blood from him taking control so suddenly, one after the other. He usually needed a few seconds between. But at the moment, Deku was glad he was pushing himself. Come on big guy. You can't seriously think you'll win this way. It's kind of unfair. Isn't it cheating to hide your ride like that? Shoji looked up with a sea sea cat eyebrow. No, midnight would ha. Shoji's eyes glazed over and he stopped running. Good. No open your arms. Shinsu commanded. Shoji did as told, revealing Asuisen and Mintasen, who both also had the same glazed look about them. Shinsu reached up, trying to tug the three headbands from Mintasen's head, but they were stuck to his harris. I can't get them off. Shinsu sighed. Command Minta to take them off for you. Deku said. Take off all of your headbands and give them to me. Minta did as asked and handed over not only the 10 million points, but also one that was worth 420 points and one that was worth 125. Deku started to place them around his neck when Shinsu stopped him. Mix up the order. Don't just put the 10 million on the bottom. Also turn them so people can't see the numbers. Right? Good idea, thanks. Deku replied, reorganizing the bands. Just as the bands were placed, another group came in for the attack. The blonde boy sitting at the top of the group wore a smug expression as he passed, taking the bottom-most headband with him while his other hand slapped at Deku's shoulders. Deku hissed at the touch, freezing for a moment as fire seared across the scarred area. Izuku, Shinsu said, worry etched in his voice. He knew that of all places, Deku didn't like to be touched on his upper back. He didn't know why but it had taken only one mistake in sparring for Shinsu to figure out never to touch that spot. I, I'm F fine, Izuku gasped. In the background, he registered that the halfway time was called. Only seven minutes left. The team with the blonde turned around, facing their own team. That was clever, changing the arrangement of your points. The boy said, as their team charged. I'm a little surprised though. How did you keep me from touching you? The hell are you talking about? Shinsu asked. The boy smirked. Is that your quirk, Midoriya? Some kind of shield? Sit. He didn't respond to Shinsu. Had he caught on? Deku tapped Shinsu's arm three times. Make him talk. Shinsu looked confused, but nodded his head when Deku looked into his eyes. He's quirkless, dumbass. Didn't you know? WH what? The boy asked, surprised. Shinsu relaxed under Deku as the blonde boy's eyes clouded over. Give me your headbands, Shinsu said calmly. The blonde boy removed the bands from around his neck and started to hand them over, only to be blocked by an invisible solid wall. What are you doing, Monoma? 
One of the boys holding the blonde asked in shock. When the blonde Monoma didn't respond, the other boy cursed, slapping Monoma's back as a way to snap him out of his weird days. Deku's group took that moment to rush forward, snagging two of the four headbands grasped in Monoma's hand. 70 points and 225. Yuraraka, we need a reprieve from the attacks, Deku said. The girl nodded, and they were airborne once more. Once in the air, Hatsum helped direct the remaining shoe to guide them back over to their ammo. It was the safest option considering the lack of offensive or even defensive quirks available on the team. In reality, unless Shinsu got someone to talk, which was much more unlikely in a battle, Yuraka was the only true quirk user at this point. What is up with Team Midoriya? came Yamadesensei's voice. They look like sitting ducks up there. Deku had to perform a breathing exercise, so he wouldn't yell at the man to shut the FCK up. At the announcement, their group was attacked once more by Shiozaki's vines. Izuku put his knives to good use once more, this time cutting the vines before they got too close. At the call for three minutes, everyone below scrambled. It was then that Todoroki and Bakugu stopped their long-lasting battle and looked up. Incoming, Deku said, pointing towards the two powerhouses from 1A. Looks like 1A has formed a truce eraser head, Yamadesensei's voice called out. Teams Todoroki and Bakugu are working together to gain on Team Midoriya. Let it fall, Yuraraka, Deku said. The girl nodded, pushing her hands together with a small, whispered, release. The rocks surrounding them fell menacingly, crashing into both of the boys below before either could block the missiles with their quirks. Deku and his team, unfortunately, also plummeted. Before they could hit the ground full force, though Ri, Yuraraka was able to save them. That would have been nice if you could do that more than a foot above the ground. Shinsu grumbled. Well, you do it next time. Yuraraka pouted back. As she finished speaking, a shock ran through the group. Deku felt as if he had stuck a fork in an electrical socket for a split second. He might have even blacked out. He really wasn't sure. All he knew is that when the pain stopped, his team was frozen to the ground. Then Tadurki's team was upon him, as well as Kakin's. Not. Good. Both boys snatched at the headbands, each managing to grab one. Deku heaved a sigh when he noticed that neither were the ten million. One minute, forty seconds remaining. Kakin charged again, his explosions making Deku's ears ring. Hatsum pulled one of Deku's flash bombs and threw it at the boy, stalling him. Just enough time to hack at the thin layer of ice, encasing the three teammates. One minute, sixteen seconds. Tadaroki came next, moving in from the side as his ice expanded outwards. Yuraraka floated the group for a split instant as the ice passed under, not allowing it to freeze them again. Hatsum activated the remaining boot, and the group flew past Todoroki in a diagonal motion. It wasn't enough as Ida, from Todoroki's group, suddenly propelled Todoroki forward, snagging yet another band. Still, Deku maintained his 10 million point band. What luck! 43 seconds. The three groups faced one another. Deku's team still in the lead. This was bad, though. If he lost the headband, they would end up dead last. He needed a buffer. Deku threw his knives, aiming towards Todoroki, who currently held the most headbands. The string-wrapped weapon nabbed onto two of them. As Deku pulled, both Kakin and Todoroki's group sprinted towards him. The headbands reached Deku's hand before the boys. But they were on fire. 19 seconds. Deku froze. 17 seconds. Hitoshi yelled. Deku swiped out his knife arm. 16 seconds. Bakugu replied. Todoroki's group stepped back. 15 seconds. Bakugu froze. Todoroki was cut. 14 seconds. Todoroki's entire left side was now engulfed in flames, no longer the tiny sparks that had been coming from him since he first squared off with Deku. 13 seconds. Deku's hands were burning. It hurt so much. His s. Hooders flared with pain. Yuraraka was reaching around. Twelve seconds. Hands grasped over the flaming bands in Deku's hands. Bakugu and his team stayed idle. Todoroki squared off to attack again. Eleven seconds. The flames on the bands were out, 
but Deku was sure he could still feel the fire racing up his arms, spreading across his back. Burning down the two-story horror house he had spent his first four years in. His mother screams as her skin roasted off her body. Time's almost up. Let's count down. Hey everybody, let's say ten. Yamade sensei voice called. Todoroki's group attacked again. His own could only back away. Yuraraka once again flying them up into the air. Nine. Ice whizzed by, cutting at Deku's cheek. He snapped out of the flashback for a brief moment until the sounds around him made him flinch once more. Eight. They were counting down. Why were they counting down? Tartaroki was coming for them again. Kakin was just standing there. Just like he always did. Seven. Deku yelled. He wasn't sure exactly what left his mouth, but it hurt. Whatever it was brought tears to his eyes and made his group fumble. It made Todoroki's group fumble. 6. Deku's group tried to back away again, but Todoroki was relentless. He dove forward, pushing his group to keep moving. The flames extended and Shinsu hissed as he was burned along with Izuku. 5. You useless piece of sit. She's hurting because of you. Now get over here. Don't make me count down. Run, Izuku. 4. 3. If I get down to 1, you know what will happen. Izuku was watching as the flames LC cut up Shinsu's uniform. He felt as they burned at his own. Only Shinsu scrambled to put his out. Izuku knew better. If you stopped them, he would just burn you worse. 2. Godamnit boy. Stop your FC king crying. Todoroki's eyes seemed to widen and his eyes spread out, covering both Shinsu and Izuku. But the damage was done. Izuku was lost. 1. Underscore 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 something was wrong. Todoroki's ice was covering. Most of the view from the stadium and smoke and dust covered the view from the cameras, leaving the audience mostly blind. But Aizawa just had a feeling. At the ending buzzer, Aizawa stood from his seat, looking down through the window. The locators on the headbands clearly stated that Izuku and his team still held the 10 million points, but the victorious group was not making themselves known. Yamada was cheering through the microphone, pumping up the cloud, but Aizawa could tell that he was tense as well. Yamada felt something was off, too. Kayama moved towards the space where Todoroki's, Bakugu's, and Izuku's groups were all huddled together. She came out a second later and gave the signal. The teachers had agreed beforehand with the trauma that Wana had faced. The trauma that Izuku, specifically, dealt with to have special signs for one another in case something happened. Kayama had given the three predetermined signs that sent ice through Aizawa's veins. Izuku. Injured. Panicking. After another moment, two more signs were sent. Aizawa needed. Infirmary. Go, I got this. Yamada whispered before redirecting the crowd once more. As Aizawa left the building, he saw Shinsu leading Izuku off the field. Izuku was unsteady his gait jolted and awkward. Shinsu was using his quirk on him. How bad was this? What had happened? Aizawa met up with the two boys, just outside the recovery tent. Shinsu's nose was dripping blood and his gaze was clouded over in pain. Izuku's eyes were blank, though his face was littered in bloody scratch marks and drying tear tracks cascaded down his cheeks. His right arm and both of his hands were burned, the smell unmistakable. FCK Underscore 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 place team name final points. First team Midoriya ten million two hundred and twenty five. Second team Todoroki wanting 230 points. Third team Bakugu won the 195 points. Fourth team Tetsutetsu 870 points. Fifth team Aoyama 785 points.
Six tied for the other seven groups. Zero points. He knew what happened when Daddy got down to one. It was never good. When Daddy counted, it meant that Izuku would be the one to count next. Count the hits. Count the kicks. Count the passing seconds and minutes and hours locked away. Count the number of screams. Or maybe the duration of the screams that came from Mama. Sometimes he'd have to do multiple options. At least he was getting really good at his math. He would rather be bad at maths. Izuku was pretty sure he wasn't in the house. He was pretty sure he wasn't four. But, a part of his brain was telling him otherwise. A part of his mind, a cruel, uncaring portion that just so happened to be at the forefront, right now darkened his surroundings, except for the ever-present flames. He could feel them L seeking up his hands and arms. Count the pain. One, two, three, four, five. And on and on he went. But something else was happening. Daddy still wasn't happy. Daddy was never happy. Izuku needed to apologize. Daddy sometimes didn't hit as long when he did a good job of being sorry. I'm sorry, it came out a scream. Not in his high-pitched voice, but the grown-up one that he normally had. Where was he again? Daddy, I'm sorry, stop, you're killing her. That wasn't even the time he actually managed to finish the job. Count the screams. One, two, three. Count the bones that you can see. Mama has a lot of bones. He knew from all the times she had explained why she was hurting when she walked, or why he felt so much pain in his wrist after Daddy broke it. He had never realized that there were bones in your face too. Not until they were visible. Who knew that Daddy's flames could melt the skin and muscle right off of a person? Only her cheek and chin were visible then, red-stained bone protruding from the unrecognizable features as the, the being, on the table screamed. It sounded like Mama. She was calling his name every now and then. Count the please. One. Two. There was never a three. She had screamed. Begged for him. Then she had opened her eyes and Izuku was sure that it was Mama. Only Mama had eyes just like his own. Green with small black flecks dusted in between. Izuku. You can't, baby. She tried. Another scream. Please, make it stop. A breath and her eyes were open again, looking at him. I lied before. Izuku was never supposed to lie. He was supposed to play the game. Mama was supposed to play the game. Did she get burned because she lied? Is this what happened when Daddy found out? Oh God, it hurts. The words were breathless this time as a single tear fell from Mama's eye. How is there any water left in her when she was still burning like this? Izuku was sure that had to be the last little bit. You can be a hero. Izuku was pretty sure he imagined that last one. Even now. There is no way she could have ever said that. Not ever. Izuku was weak, useless. But wasn't he halfway there? Wasn't he battling to prove himself right now? Wasn't he doing well? But that didn't match up with the scene he was seeing. That didn't match up to the pain he was feeling. Izuku. That voice didn't match either though. It blended with the one of the police officer. The police officer that had tried to hold him back. But he couldn't hold him back. He had made it to Mama. He had made it. But she didn't. Her eyes were open. They never closed. She didn't scream anymore. She didn't breathe anymore. Izuku was pretty sure he wasn't breathing anymore, either. Izuku, answer me. The police officer never said that. The police officer was still trying to pry his hands out of the burnt and bloodied skin that was gradually burning his own. God his hands burned. He didn't remember them ever burning this much the first time. Izuku, listen, I need you to answer me. The voice was trying again. Izuku knew this voice. It belonged in the other place. The place where Izuku lived most of the time. But Izuku wasn't in that place right now. He was here, being pulled away from Mama. Count the steps. 28 to get to the car. Izuku, can you hear me? Of course he could. Say it out loud if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes. He wasn't sure which was worse. The burnings and beatings or the closet. The closet was always so scary. Daddy put him here when he didn't want to see Izuku's face. When Izuku became too disgusting, Daddy put him in the closet 
a lot more in the last two weeks than he ever did in the past. But he also beat Izuku less. Maybe. Maybe the beatings were better. At least Mama held him after those. He was pretty sure the voice wasn't Daddy. But it locked him away too. Maybe it was the man from his second home after Mama. Maybe it was Daichisen. But that didn't quite match up either. Izuku didn't sit and cry in the closet this time. He fought back. He was pretty sure the door was breaking down the more he struggled. He was pretty sure his mind was bleeding from the effort. Could your mind bleed? Mama's head had bled. Maybe that was the same. The voice was saying nice things despite the lock on the door. Despite the chains binding his wrists and ankles. It was saying the same thing that Izuku screamed when Daddy locked him in the closet. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. But this one added things that simultaneously made sense and didn't make sense. I had to, Izuku. I'm sorry. Daddy always said he had to. If Izuku didn't listen. 5. The first warning. Sometimes, if he obeyed right then, the beating wouldn't be that bad. 4. Daddy's eyes always got darker when he got to this one. 3. Daddy's face wasn't looking like Daddy's face anymore. The black hair was the same. But this one was all wrapped up funny. A mix of Daddy with the black hair and Mama and himself with the bandages. 2. Izuku was screwed. He wasn't really allowed to use that word, but it was true. 1. Anytime Daddy got down to 1, Izuku was never sure if he or Mama would wake up the next day. In all honesty, it was better to just obey at 5. But sometimes, sometimes he ran. Instead, like the night of the fire. He ran. Mama locked the door of his bedroom. So, he grabbed All Might and left through the window and down the tree. Mama had told him to run, after all. And the locked door opened. It was enough. Just barely enough for Izuku to remember that he was 15. He was screaming. Izawa-sensei was trying to calm him down, but Izuku couldn't stop. He needed out. He needed the burning to stop. Oh God, it hurt so much. His back was on fire. He didn't remember Todoroki's flames reaching his back. Underscore 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 Izawa cursed his lame body for being unable to care for his brat. He couldn't hold him like this. He couldn't comfort him. All he could do was be present. All he could do was speak calming words. One arm holding the boy's wrists to keep him from scratching and and hitting himself as he had when Shinsu first released control. At some point, this kid's face would scar from the scratches. Luckily, Recovery Girl had healed him each and every time thus far. The kid wasn't physically hurt anymore, only mentally. And that only seemed to make this worse for Aizawa to watch. It burns. It burns. Sensei, make it stop. He wailed, jerking his arms in Aizawa's grasp. There are no more injuries on his hands or arm. Recovery girl said, inspecting the boy once more. I don't know what he's talking about. Aizawa knit his brows together. SHH, Izuku, it's okay. You're okay. You aren't burned anymore he said while he thought through what the boy might actually be experiencing. The kid just continued to cry, doubling over as he rocked. He mumbled broken phrases through the sobs most of which were apologies, but some of which sent chills down Aizawa's spine. Please, please daddy. I'm sorry. D don't hurt her. D D don't hurt her. I'm SS sorry. Aizawa tried to soothe Izuku again, but the boy didn't seem to register his words. I'm sorry. I will L listen. I'll see come. Every now and then, the boy would count. Most of the time, he would count forward. But twice, the boy counted back, cringing with each number until he screamed out in pain once more when he reached one. This was what seemed to be the trigger for making Izuku feel the phantom burning sensation. Tashinori came into the room, a private area that Recovery Girl had led Izuku to before Shinsu was told to release the boy. The skeletal hero took one look at the scene and took over in holding Izuku's arms apart. A look of sheer anguish on his face. What's going on? Panic attack. Is he still hurt? 
No, Aizawa said with a sigh. But I think I know how to fix it. Help me get his shirt off. Tashinori complied, carefully removing the boy's shirt without letting Izuku continue his personal attack. Izuku, listen. Aizawa said when Izuku fell into one of his mumbling fits. I need you to lie down on your stomach so I can stop the burn. Can you do that? Lie down on your stomach. Izuku's breath hitched, but he moved to comply. Whimpers escaping his lips. I'm sorry. I'm SS sorry. It's okay. I, I accept your apology. Aizawa said. He hated the words as they came out of his lips. There was absolutely no reason for Izuku to apologize. It was idiotic for Aizawa to accept it. But it made logical sense to do so if only to calm him down. And it did. Izuku quieted significantly after those words. Chiyo, do you have cool packs? Aizawa asked as he set a hand close to Izuku's shoulder blades. They felt feverish, even though Aizawa wasn't actually touching them. Izuku's body had done this during previous panic attacks as well, sending blood rushing to the area and making it heat up. His body was quite literally burning itself while his mind played tricks on him. The woman went to the other side of the room quickly, opening a cabinet. I, I t-tried. I tried and in not to. Izuku whispered, his hands still held securely by Toshinori. I t tried. You did fine, kid. You've done nothing wrong. Aizawa said. I did didn't listen. I did didn't ggo right away. And, and he, he gg got to one. Aizawa hesitated, not understanding the words. He didn't ask, however, not wanting to set the kid off again. Chiyo laid some ice packs over the marred skin on Izuku's upper back, her brows knitting together as she watched the boy visibly relax some more deep exhaustion finally settling over him. This old wound should not be hurting him now, the woman said, studying Izuku with her eyes. I'm thinking it's mental, Aizawa said with a sigh. His mind is causing the pain while he relives the trauma. H.M. The woman hummed. That would make sense. I should also check for nerve damage at a later date, as well. Just in case. I D didn't listen, Izuku murmured again. Aizawa ran his good hand through the curls, humming a non-committal response. I, I shouldn't V, Izuku slurred, not finishing the sentence. Sleep, Izuku, Aizawa said softly. After a few minutes, the boy's breaths started to come along more evenly. Aizawa helped Tashinori wash the blood off of the kid's face and hands whilst Recovery Girl was called away. While they were busy, the door opened once more. Shinsu. Aizawa said, surprise leaking through his voice. Get out. Aizawa said sternly. The violet eyes were wide as he looked at the scar ranging across Izuku's back. He didn't leave. I, I didn't. Is he okay? Shinsu asked hesitantly. Aizawa glared at the boy, but Shinsu straightened and looked back, defiance clear in his gaze. Is he okay? Shinsu asked again, more confidently. Aizawa sighed, backing down. He's fine. He grumbled. Physically. He added on when he noticed the disbelieving look in Shinsu's face. The boy seemed to deflate at the news, walking over to his friend, who was still lying on his stomach. I heard him screaming. Shinsu whispered. It wasn't your fault. Aizawa said, noticing the unsteady look in the boy's pale face. He wasn't screaming because of the brainwashing. It was the fire. Shinsu said sadly. I didn't know it was that bad. Aizawa frowned. He hadn't realized how bad the pyrophobia was either. What happened? Tashinori asked. I couldn't tell from the stands. Shinsu looked up at the man warily. Are you Izuku's foster parent? He asked nervously. Tashinori spit up blood at the comet. And not quite, my boy. The skeletal man said. Just, just a friend. Shinsu looked uncertain at the response. He isn't lying. He is a friend. Aizawa confirmed. I would also like to know what happened. The ice, smoke, and dust blocked the view. Shinsu shifted, scratching at the back of his neck before speaking. I, I'm not super clear on everything. Shinsu said slowly. Todoroki and Bakugu were coming for us. They had taken every headband except the ten million pointer. Izuku grabbed two of Todoroki's bands by using his knives as grips, but 
Todoroki was using his quirk, and the bands caught fire. Toshinori and Aizawa continued to clean Izuku's hands, arm, and face while Shinsu spoke. They were in flames when he grabbed onto them. Then he froze. Shinsu took a breath. He cut Todoroki which made the flames go even higher. Self-defense, I think. I was able to take control of Bakugu to make him stop his attack. Yuraraka took the headbands and smothered the flames. She ended up throwing them back at Todoroki when he attempted to attack again. Just as a distraction. I think she knew something was wrong, like I did. Shinsu paused for a bit, drawing Aizawa's full attention. Izuku was pretty much clean now, anyway. Then what? Aizawa asked. He screamed something. Shinsu whispered. He, he begged his dad to stop. He apologized. He, he looked Todoroki in the eye and told him that he was killing someone. A woman, I think. It made him stop. For a few seconds. Shinsu sat in the chair by the wall. But then he got mad, or something. His team attacked again and the flames wrapped around us, burning me and Izuku. I think Hatsumesen got a little burned too. But he stopped it as soon as he realized what was happening. He sent his ice out, smothering the flames. Then, time was called. Aizawa sighed. He knew Todoroki didn't have much control over his left side. But he hadn't expected the control to be that bad. After the fact, Izuku was frozen. We put him down and, and he, well, you saw his face. He was crying and screaming. I, I didn't think he'd want the whole world to see him in the middle of a panic attack. I know I'm not supposed to, but, I, I used my quirk to get him away. You did well, Shinsu, Aizawa said. The boy relaxed once more. Izuku started to stir, and all three people in the room snapped to attention. Toshinori didn't touch Izuku waiting to see if he would have to keep Izuku from hurting himself again. Say Izuku murmured, turning to his side and causing the three ice packets to fall off his back. Hey, kid, Aizawa said softly. Izuku was completely dazed, looking at the man with confusion as he sat up. Tashinori helped him along the way, encouraging the boy to just lie back down though his advice was ignored. What happened? Izuku slurred holding his head and squeezing his eyes shut tightly. You had a panic attack, Aizawa said softly. Izuku jerked, but didn't lift his head from his hands. Todoroki accidentally set you on fire, Aizawa said more slowly, watching Izuku's every reaction. The small boy stilled, looking up at Aizawa in horror. I, I thought, he closed his mouth, eyes darting to Aizawa's right, where Shinsu sat behind him. Izuku tensed. I, his eyes filled with tears. I'm sorry, Izuku said softly, the whispered words barely audible. I, I am miss things oop. Shinsu looked surprised before taking control of his expression once more. What are you talking about? We won, Izuku. Now it was Izuku's turn to look surprised. WH what? We kept the 10 million point headband. We are going into the third round. The tears fell from Izuku's eyes as he smiled. A small laugh coming from him more from shock than anything. Kid? Are you okay? Aizawa asked. Izuku looked at him, eyes slightly wide. I, I th think so. I, my b back isn't bb burning anymore. The look of confusion that crossed Shinsu's face was unmistakable. You're back. But, Todoroki only got your arms. Izuku shifted nervously in his seat. Old, old trauma, Toshi, it... It hasn't even really left. Izuku's left arm reached up to touch at his shoulder. You, you S.A. shouldn't have S.S. seen it. It's ugly. I'm sorry. Shinsu shook his head, but didn't say anything. Telling Izuku to stop saying sorry at this point was clearly a losing battle. Kid, I'm serious. Are you all right? I need you to tell me the truth. Aizawa said again. Izuku flinched. I already T.T. told you. I th think so. Aizawa sighed. Do you need to sit out the rest of the festival? He finally asked. Do I need to call Inuison from the second year arena? Izuku straightened quickly, eyes darkening. Don't you dare. He hissed, Deku coming out full force. I'm not hurting. I'm sane right now. I worked strong to get here. You can't take me out. Not to. 
to go do some stupid F-seeking therapy. Aizawa sighed. This was going to be a difficult conversation, but he needed to be absolutely sure that Izuku would be okay to continue. Shinsu, thank you for your help. Go rest before your battle. Aizawa said in dismissal of the boy, giving him, Toshinori, and Izuku some essential privacy for the upcoming talk. Underscore 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 Izuku was moved into the main healing tent. Now that he was calm, the boy was mortified that he had broken down during the battle. And he was terrified of the conversation Aizawa sensei had promised would occur at a later date. But for now, he was also relieved that he would be allowed to continue the festival after some rest. Aizawa sensei had been reluctant. But it wasn't like Izuku was physically injured anymore. He wanted a chance. He wanted to keep going. Due to a collective agreement among the teachers looking over the first year section, the battle schedule was reworked, allowing for a complete switch. Thus, instead of fighting first, which is what the automated scheduler had come up with, Izuku would now fight last. His first opponent was Ashido. Until then, he was allowed to watch the festival from the hospital wing. He was also allowed to tap out at any point until his battle if he felt it was needed. Izuku refused to be that weak. Izuku and Shinsu hadn't been the only injuries. Most of the students from the second round needed some type of healing. Two students, from 1B, Honuki and Oase, both had concussions from the falling rocks courtesy of Izuku's group. Thus, the two were banned from continuing by Recovery Girl. Brain injuries were not something that her form of healing dealt with well, and she would not risk a negative outcome. Thus, the two students with the highest points from the first task were chosen out of the fifth place team. These two students were both from Wana Ajiru and Takoyami. That meant that more than half of the final contestants were now from 1A. Eraserhead, your students are amazing. What the hell are you teaching them? Yamade sensei's voice called out from the TV screen. This has nothing to do with me. Each of them is powered by their own drive to succeed. Came Aizawa sensei's lazy drawl. There you have it. Eraserhead is a terrible teacher. Yamade sensei quipped back quickly. I'm what? Came Aizawa's irritated voice. Yamade-sensei opted to ignore him, however, and explained the layout of the final round. Izuku missed a good portion due to his laughter that was gladly shared with Hitoshi, who now sat in the bed next to him. The boy, for once, wasn't sleeping despite having recently been healed. Instead, he was watching the battles, just like Izuku would be. Izuku didn't miss the worried glances sent his way, however. He ignored them, though. He didn't want to answer the question in the other boy's gaze. He didn't have to. He wouldn't. The first battle was between Class B's Shiozaki and Class A's Kaminari. Izuku had the base idea of Shiozaki's quirk thanks to the first two rounds, but the knowledge was limited. On the other hand, Izuku had a pretty solid idea as to how Kaminari's quirk worked and the boy's capabilities in battle. Kaminari was intelligent, but immature. He had yet to gain the ability to use his intelligence in battle, often leading him to use one major blast of his quirk. Of course, by doing so, he short-circuited his brain for a bit basically making him the definition of a one-hit wonder. Considering the nature of Shiozaki's quirk and her overall demeanor, Izuku guessed that she would be the victor before the fight even started. So when the battle ended in under a minute, he was not terribly surprised. Shinsu whistled. I could have taken him down that quickly, he mused. Not without an electrical shield. Plant matter is a natural absorbent. Shiozaki lucked out with her quirk. Izuku said as he wrote notes in the book he had brought with him. Shinsu frowned, turning to Izuku. You don't think I could beat him? Really? Izuku looked up. Oh, you could definitely beat Kaminari. But his electrical surge has a wide range. Almost anyone would go down without a buffer. He usually does well in standoff fights like this, however. His specialty should most likely be group takedowns because of it. You, on the other hand, are more similar to Aizawa Sensei and myself. You need to use logic and more, stealthy techniques. In this case, you probably would have lost. 
But this system isn't really realistic compared to the real-world fights that heroes face. Shinsu was grinning ear to ear. What? Izuku asked, confused. You are very comfortable when you analyze things. Shinsu observed. I just find it funny. You are such a nerd. The words were said with humor, a small smirk forming on the boy's face. Izuku flushed, turning away. Well, excuse me FF for utilizing my BBB brain, he said, cursing the stutter. Underscore 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 Aizawa groaned as Hatsume Mei from 1H toyed with Ada. The boy was like a dangly puppet in her masterful sales pitch. It was almost painful to watch. Thank the gods that the girl was in the support course. Aizawa didn't think he could handle another troublemaker. No wonder Power Loader nearly quit when the idea of Izuku becoming a full-time support course student was brought up. Hatsume may seemed like plenty of stress all on her own. The girl didn't ease on the sales pitch for over ten minutes, toying with a poor boy through the use of her multitude of support gadgets. At the end, she stepped out of the rink of her own accord. Aizawa would need to work with the boy on his naivete. Never trust an enemy, even if they seem harmless. They are usually are out for blood. Underscore 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 Shinsu was dying with laughter. Oh God, I hope I can face him at some point. He'd be way too easy. Izuku smiled as well. You could probably get him to talk even after he knows about your quirk, too. Ida is overtly serious, but he has a kind heart. Those are good traits for a hero, but it makes him gullible due to his lack of experience. She completely played him. Shinsu smirked. Hatsumesen will always put her future goals above the dignity of others. Izuku said with a small laugh. I learned that pretty early on. Recovery girl came around to the gurney. The two boys were sharing and huffed. The two of you should be resting after the healing I provided. The small woman scolded. I have insomnia. No point in trying. Shinsu said offhandedly. I'd rather not have a nightmare right now. Deku said disinterested in the woman's fussing. The woman looked exasperated by their replies, but simply shook her head. You youth will always insist on pushing yourselves. She mumbled, pulling out a handful of gummies. At least eat a few of these, they will help you regain some energy and stamina. Thanks, Izuku chirped, taking a few. Shinsu grunted and took some as well. The next matchup was between 1B's Tetsutetsu and 1A's Kirishima. They are basically mirror images of one another, Shinsu said after watching the fight for a few minutes. I bet they'll tie. Their power outputs and mental capabilities appear to be the same. Izuku murmured as he filled in notes on the 1B student. No way. You've guessed the outcome of the past two matches, even the part where Hatsumisen stepped out of the ring willingly. I'm not betting against you. Izuku grinned. If they have a tiebreaker, I'm at a loss. Wanna beat then? Shinsu stopped, thinking. If it comes to a tiebreaker, 10 yen on white-haired dude. The redhead seemed too nice when I met him in your class. Deal. Izuku said, a sit-eating grin on his face at the underestimation of his hero course classmate. Shinsu paused, looking at Izuku for a moment. Can I change my vote? Absolutely not, Izuku said. It took five minutes for the two brutes to knock one another out. Wow, that hurt me and all I'm doing is watching these guys, Yamade-sensei's voice called out from the TV screen. Is it over? A tie, Shinsu said. I may as well give you the money now. 
underscore 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 Aizawa excused himself during the 10-minute break between fights. He needed to check on the problem child. He did not want to check on the problem child. Izuku had been pissed when Aizawa suggested he not continue with the festival. The boy had practically told the man to FCK off. No, not practically. He did tell Aizawa to FCK off. The bandaged man sighed. In the end, he had allowed Izuku to continue. It wasn't like the boy was physically hurt, nor was the boy incapable of winning. Ultimately, Aizawa was a little happy that Izuku was pushing himself. Heroes didn't really get mental health days. Then again, this was just a kid. This was his kid a fact that was scaring Aizawa more and more each day. Since when had he become so possessive of the child? Hell, he wasn't even technically his foster parent. As the head of UA, Nezu was. Yet here he was, fighting with himself. Listen to the side of his mind telling him to forbid Izuku from continuing the side that seemed more and more like a parent. Or, listen to the side telling him to t let the kid do what he wants the teacher side that wanted to encourage his students to do their best, and to never give up. Ultimately, both sides were winning right now as he walked down to the healing area. Izuku was still going to fight, for now. But he was also resting. Or he should be resting. Not only that, but Aizawa was coming down to double-check that he was okay to ensure that the kid didn't need him. It occurred to the black-haired man that this kid might just have him wrapped around a finger. As he entered, he was slightly miffed to find Shinsu and Izuku in the far bed, speaking about the matches and, very obviously, not resting. You two are supposed to be sleeping, or at least resting. Aizawa snapped when he came up to the two. Shinsu had the sense to look sheepish, but Izuku merely rolled his eyes. It's fine, sensei. Recovery girl gave us energy gummies or something, Izuku said, looking down at the notebook in his hands. Think his organs turn to steel when he activates his quirk. Shinsu rubbed a hand down his face, shaking his head at the boy beside him. We did try to sleep at first, Aizawa sensei The purple-haired boy said, face impassive. But the chance to watch potential opponents in action was just too much to pass up. Aizawa sighed, looking at the screen. He only had a few minutes before he needed to head back to the commentator's booth. Next is Bakugu versus Yuraka. He said slowly. Aizawa didn't miss the slight tense in Izuku's shoulders. So it is, Izuku said. Aizawa took a small breath before speaking again. Are you able to watch the battle without? I'll be fine. Izuku cut him off. Don't treat me like I'm glass. Not now. The boy ground out pointedly not looking at either Shinsu nor Aizawa. Shinsu shifted uncomfortably. I'll turn it off, if I see him get too uncomfortable, Shinsu said. Izuku looked up angrily, a betrayed look crossing his face as he stared at the boy beside him. Aizawa nodded at the purple-haired teen before turning and walking away. Underscore 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 you. I'm not a little kid you have to look out for. Deku hissed. I know. Shinsu said. You're a confusing ass, traumatized, split personality, self-deprecating teenager. Who, for whatever reason, I can tolerate. Shinsu huffed. Deal with it. Deku paused for a moment, taking in the words. We've strongly known each other for three months. That's longer than some of the homes I've lived in. Shinsu said. Deku had nothing to reply to that. I don't know much about you. I thought I did, but I don't. Shinsu whispered looking down at his hands. You don't know much about me either, though, so it's fair. Either way, you are still a lot closer to me than most people. Deku tensed. I'm not telling you anything. I don't expect you to. I'm not telling you anything either. Neither of us need the specifics. 
We already mesh well together. No need to muddy what we have even more than it already is. I thought you would demand answers. Deku says. Shinsu shifted. You never demand answers from me. Underscore 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 The battle between Kakin and Yoraka was brutal. Kakin. He was almost terrifying in his sheer power. But Yuraraka held her own. She made a solid plan that targeted Kakin's weaknesses. She even incorporated what worked from the second task and altered it to work better in this one-on-one -on -one match. Overall, it was probably the most exciting match thus far. She came so close to winning, Izuku was prepared to bite his own words from before the match started. Yuraraka had very clearly grown much more in the month and half that Izuku had been gone than the boy had originally thought. Alas, Yuraraka still lost. It wasn't just the battle that had caught Izuku's attention, however. It was the dialogue playing out among the crowd, Yamade-sensei and Aizawe-sensei. Izuku never really realized how much respect his dark-haired guardian had for Wana until he was outright scolding both Yamade-sensei and the people in the stands. To an extent, Izuku felt like the man was scolding him as well. Izuku would be lying. If he said that Kakin didn't sometimes come across as villainous in his actions, he would be lying if he said that the explosive boy didn't cause him to freeze in fear at times. But Aizawa sensei had a point. Yuraraka was strong. She was doing her best. It would have been foolish for Kakin to let down his guard, or even think about underestimating her. Deku often struggled with this concept. It was something that he and Eraserhead had spoken about on many occasions. Humans. They were capable of great feats when they were desperate. Izuku knew that. It was one of the main differences between the two personalities. The Izuku side never gave in when it mattered. That side always kept pushing forward, testing the limits and crossing over them. That was the side that had rushed in the first time he had met Eraserhead. The Deku side, on the other hand, was analytical. Rarely did this side act without a plan. Rarely did the Deku side push beyond the possible limits. This was the side that so quickly calculated who would win based on capabilities. This side never took into account the heart of a person. When the two mixed, like they did at the USG, Deku was at his top game. But when they were so separate, as they had been lately, things became difficult. It was strong to explain how two opposing views worked so well together. The only thing that he could really explain was that neither side worked well alone. It was one of his current major flaws. Here Deku was, passing judgments on fights before they even occurred. Even if he had been right thus far, he should be more careful in the future. Yuraraka proved that you could never know what sheer force of will could lead you to do. If the girl had had just a little more stamina, she very well may have won. Underscore 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 The following battles passed relatively quickly. Izuku had been right in guessing that Kirishima would win the arm wrestling competition and now had an extra 10 yen in his pocket. The next battle between Yeyurazu and Takoyami also ended how Izuku had theorized. Yeyurazu hadn't even had the chance to use the items she created before Takoyami knocked her out of the ring. Overall, after the fight between Kakin and Yuraraka, it was kind of boring. Shinsu was supposed to go to a focus room now, but opted to stay by Izuku's side to watch the final fight before his own. The freckled-faced boy wasn't sure if he did this for Izuku's sake or not, but it both irritated him and filled him with warmth that the boy had stayed. However, the comfort was certainly not needed. Siro had wrapped Todoroki in his tape, swinging him towards the edge of the ring, only for a giant ice pillar to shoot up. The hospital room shook with the sheer force of the quirk in action. Almost half of the stadium was now covered in ice. Siro and Midnight were both trapped in its depths. Shivering uncontrollably. Sarokun, came Midnight's quivering voice. Can you move? 
after a few seconds in which Ciro must have responded. Midnight continued. Sarokan is immobilized. Todoroki-kun advances to the second round. Izuku stared at the screen in shocked silence, right alongside Shinsu, as the crowd rose in a chorus of don't worry about it. The small figure of Todoroki walked towards the ice wall, placing his left hand against Ciro's ch sink, the ice beginning to melt instantly. He looks, Izuku whispered, not realizing he was speaking out loud. So sad. Shinsu glanced at him, an eyebrow raising. Yet, the boy said nothing on the subject as they watched Todoroki melt the icy monstrosity that he had created. After a minute or so, Shinsu stood. I'm up next, he whispered. Izuku snapped out of his reverie, looking at his friend. Shinsu looked calm, his face impassive, his breath steady. But Izuku could see the slight tremble in his hands. He was nervous. You can do this, Izuku said calmly, meeting the violet gaze. I know you will win. Underscore 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 despite his confident words of all the battles. This was the one he was least certain of. Shinsu's quirk would provide an automatic win, so long as his opponent spoke to him. However, Ajiru wasn't much of a conversationalist. Now was he one to stand idly by. The boy would wipe Shinsu out quickly, if he could. And he could. Ajiru was on par with Izuku when it came to pure, one-on-one, -on -one, hand to hand combat. The two were currently tied for wins and losses. Izuku still had the upper hand when it came to experience and weapon use, but Ajiru could certainly hold his own. Shinsu had to make him talk, and fast, if he wanted to win. Underscore 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 Shinsu took a deep breath as he walked onto the stage, his opponent matching his steps. The roar of the crowd was deafening. But at the same time, the ringing in his ears barely allowed him to hear it. Shinsu had watched Ojiru back when he had detention. He knew the kid was skilled. He might even be able to fight Midoriya. Izuku was faster, smaller, more agile. But Ojiru had the ingrained technique from years of study. His movements were fluid, graceful, and powerful. If this turned into a fist fight, Shinsu would lose. At the sound of Go. Shinsu didn't even have the chance to open his mouth. Ojiru was on him in an instant, moving in close and attempting to sweep Shinsu with his tail. Shinsu dodged, the motion slow compared to Midoriya. But the dodge left him open, Ojiru taking the chance to jab Shinsu in the ribs. In a matter of only a few seconds, Shinsu was on the defense, being led backwards towards the boundary line. He barely blocked a kick, the force of which sent him back a few meters. Damn, Shinsu shouted, purposefully putting frustration and a bit of curiosity into his tone. The hell kind of martial arts is that? he asked. As Anjiru attacked again, the boy answered ever so respectful. It is traditional car, midway through another punch, Anjiru stopped. Shinsu had his hand up, making sure to show that he was making contact with the other boy. He needed to throw off his future opponents, if there would be any after Midoriya. He didn't want them to know that Shinsu's quirk was voice-based. That, that would ruin everything. Now that Ojiru was under his control, Shinsu carefully stepped away. Walk out of bounds, he commanded. Ojiru's body tensed. The strain on Shinsu's mind heightened for a brief moment, before it all relaxed as Ojiru obeyed. He didn't fight nearly as much as Aizawa-sensei or Yamada-sensei did in training, and the boy would never even touch Izuku's willpower at this rate. All in all, this was exceptionally easy. He would have laughed if his ribs didn't protest when he breathed. 
underscore 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 Izuku walked slowly on his way towards the arena opening. Shinsu's fight had gone spectacularly well. Had he been an outsider, he would have had no idea how Shinsu took control, just as the two of them had planned before the festival. It was magnificent to watch. Now, however, it was his turn. He had sent his message to the commentator's booth when Shinsu had left the room. He only hoped that Yamade-sensei heeded its warning. He wanted this to be exciting for the audience. Izuku had a feeling his next fight with Shinsu would be significantly less thrilling. As he stepped outside, the large columns of fire caught his eye immediately. He couldn't help but take a step back. The memories from his panic had gradually grown more and more clear, and the sight of fire was not helping. Izuku took a deep breath, however, and closed his eyes. When he opened them, Deku was in place. Deku was brave. So long as the fire stayed put, Deku could do this. It was only when fire moved, specifically towards him, that Deku tended to panic in the same way that Izuku did, kind of like how Todoroki's flames had reached for him in the second round. No, don't think about that. He needed to focus. He had a plan. He needed to focus on the plan. Ashido was suddenly in front of him, grinning widely. Hey Midoriya, she cheered. We missed you up in the stands. Deku jolted slightly at her happy tone, raising a brow. I'm in one sea, Ashidosan. We wouldn't be sitting together, anyway. The girl pouted, crossing her arms. Boo. They should just let you join full time. Especially after those first two rounds. That was amazing, by the way. Thanks. Deku said with a gentle smile. To my right, we have Ashido Mina from 1A. Another one of yours, I missed her grumpy. Yamade-sensei's voice called. Stop it with the nicknames. Aizawa sensei sighed. Ashido and Izuku both smiled. And, to my left, we have the rising star taking first place in both the first and second rounds. Midoriya Izuku from 1C, Yamade-sensei cheered. I kind of feel bad that they aren't letting everyone know that I technically qualify for the hero course. Deku laughed slightly. Nah, it's fine. Maybe it'll convince those dum-dums that won't let you join for real. Ashido said, grinning. Of course, you can't convince them if you don't win. And Midoriya. Her face turned significantly more serious despite her still grinning features. I don't plan to lose. Deku smirked. Good to know. Midnight blew the starting whistle and Deku moved, ducking forward and to the side, gaining entry into Ashido's personal space. Grabbing the small, marble-sized capsule in his belt, Deku threw it to the ground. A heavy smoke immediately filled the space, blinding Ashido in the process. Deku reached up and touched his earpiece, copying a motion that Hatsum had made earlier. He was now connected with the sound system, the stadium able to hear every word he spoke. I do hope that the heat signature cameras have been set up, Deku said. This would be no fun if the audience can't watch the show. How on earth are these students connecting to the speakers? Yamade-sensei questioned. Deku chuckled, his voice ringing out over the stadium. He pulled down his goggles, turning on the heat signature section, and aimed straight for Ishida. He can't use support gear, someone from the audience called out, enraged. Of course I can. Deku replied as he ducked under one of Ishido's blind punches, sweeping her feet from under her, only to have her swing back up in a wide, 360-degree kick. He's right. Aizawa sensei sighed. Only hero course students aren't allowed support items. Any other class, so long as they made the items themselves, are allowed to use them only so long as they are registered. All of my tools were most certainly registered. For example, this lovely Inkai substance is an economically friendly version of a smoke screen. Deku said, backing off from his fight. It blinds but does not harm. I use the same makeup that is found in Squid Ink. Deku had to block an attack from Ashido as she followed the sound of his voice. He used her momentum to lead them towards the edge of the ring, giving him the option to end the fight quickly if need be. 
You are not playing with me how that Hatsum girl messed with Ada, Ashido called. Of course not, Ashidasen, Deku said as he backed away once more. I won't let the fight drag on that long. I don't have nearly as many support items to show off. Ashido screamed in frustration, her body temperature heightening as she called for her quirk. Perfect. As you can see by the monitors, Ashidosen's body temperature rises when she calls to her quirk. This is actually an extremely common occurrence with nearly 40% of quirks causing a change in body temperature. With these, you have a much greater chance of understanding if and when someone is using a quirk. Deku said happily. That is why I have created a detailed program and imputed it into the cameras that are currently in use. Deku took out a remote and pressed one of the buttons on it. His goggles lit up with information and possible theories as to Ashido's quirk. What's this? Aizawa sensei asked, sounding extremely bored with a hint of unnerve as Deku messed with Ashido. The man was most likely having flashbacks to the times he had been messed with. This is the formula I created to provide information to those who need more protection from villains such as the police. It takes note of the height, approximate weight, facial structure, fighting style, body heat, and visual quirk usage in order to identify a subject. I have been working on it since the start of the year. If you program known criminals and villains into the system, the goggles that I am wearing can pick up the small nuances of the person and then find you the closest matches. I, of course, could not access records of UA students without being expelled. So instead, the goggles are providing me information that could possibly help me take Ashidosen down. The smoke screen was clearing now and Ashido looked beyond pissed once her face came into view. That is not good, Deku said as she attacked, flipping him onto his back. He was able to roll with the fall, however, only to slip on some of her acid that she had left behind. Deku grabbed the small pouches from his belt and threw them at both the ground and at the girl, specifically aiming for her hands, arms, and feet. What on earth is that? Yamade-sensei cried out as the white powder cloaked the girl, making her sneeze and back away from him. It looks like baby powder. Aizawa-sensei drawled. Not really, Aizawa-sensei. He corrected, a CCKY grin appearing on his face as he dodged one of Ashido's attacks. The girl was swift, her movements smooth and adaptable. She was one of the few that actually gave Deku a strong time in class. It's actually pretty close to baking soda, though I tweaked the formula just a little bit to make it much safer when interacting with other substances Deku said, flipping back out of Ashido's grasp. It's used to neutralize acids, poisons, and a multitude of other emitter-type quirks. He clarified. Ashido's eyes widened at his words and she immediately attempted to use her quirk. The powder on her skin did nothing more than clump together. I made sure that the substance would not harm a living being, only block any substance produced. Deku spoke again. Ashido dove towards him, swiping off the powder as best she could, but to no avail. As you can see, Deku continued, this allows a more even playing field for those who are not allowed to use their quirks to apprehend a criminal all without bringing actual harm to either party. Deku finally dove in, meeting Ashido in hand to hand. She was good, but her motions were slowed from her confusion and the uncomfortably heavy sludge that was now forming on her skin. It took about three minutes to take her down completely. As I've demonstrated, I have been working on a multitude of support items, not for heroes who are free to use their quirks, but for the heroes who aren't. He paused, giving time for his words to sink in. The police force is severely lacking in combat support, often having to rely on heroes to do jobs that really shouldn't need much help. This not only overworks heroes, but it allows many criminals to escape as well as make the police look like fools. With support items, this can change by safely and effectively understanding when a quirk is in use and having the means to neutralize the quirk, the police will be better able to protect those in need. Clever, Yamada-sensei yelled out. After only five more seconds of having Ashidasen pinned, Deku was declared the winner. He turned off his calm as he stood and held out a hand towards the girl. I'm sorry for messing with you Ashidasen, but my tools also deserved a sales pitch. You actually had me on my toes there for a little while. You did really well, despite my antics. Ashido pouted her lip, but took his hand anyway. 
That was really mean, Midoriya-kun. She said, a whine in her voice. Deku shifted uncomfortably, bowing his head slightly. I'm really sorry, if, if it makes you feel better. I had plans for everyone. The entire first year class. It wasn't that I just targeted you. I just happened to end up being paired with you. The girl pouted more. That makes it worse, Midoriya-kun. He flinched at her words, bowing lower. I really am sorry if I embarrassed you. She smiled, ruffling a hand through his hair. I guess it's okay. I understand kinda. But you better bet I'll get you back, she said, pumping a fist into the air. Now how do I get this stuff off? It's all sticky. Deku grinned as he walked out of the stadium with her, explaining how to wash the substance off completely and providing her with a special soap to ensure that it would all be removed after only one shower. Underscore 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 what just happened? Did Deku, the previous vigilante Deku, just show off support items he made for the police? Seriously. Since when had he ever shown support for them? Aizawa was at a loss for words. He had expected the boy to take down a Shido relatively quickly. Instead, he had given a sales pitch. As if he were in the support course. Then again, he technically was in the support course. Not only that, he also showed off his skill. Not only as a creator, inventor, and chemist, but as a fighter as well. It was unmistakable that Ashido was using high-level skills and Izuku had kept up with ease. Of course, Aizawa had already known he could do that. But this may just be the push that the courts needed in order to allow him full access to the hero course. If Izuku went all the way, he wouldn't need to prove himself any longer. At least not to CPS. Aizawa glanced over at his husband once Izuku was declared the winner. He looked pleasantly surprised by the outcome. He also looked a little sick. That kid is going to be the death of anyone he fights someday, Yamada said softly. He neutralized her quirk like it was nothing. Cho, I wonder what he would do against quirks such as ours, Aizawa said. Well, yours isn't really a problem, is it? Yamada replied with a grin. Eraserhead can't erase a quirk if it doesn't exist. Aizawa sighed a small laugh. I can still take him down easily. Oh, I know, Yamada said fondly. But it might not always be that way. The first battle of the quarterfinals ended in under a minute. In all honesty, it was a little shocking that the battle didn't take longer. Then again, Ida certainly had to make up for the foolish way he had looked in his first battle. At the whistle, Ida had called out loudly, though the words didn't quite reach the microphones on the screen. Then he had disappeared with a blur, only to reappear behind Shizaki, who hadn't even had time to use her vines yet. Ida grabbed the girl's shoulders and ran, knocking her out of the ring quickly and not giving her time to realize what was happening. Shiozaki is out of bounds, Midnight called after a brief moment of shock. Ida from Class 1 wins. Ida gave a small bow to the girl and then mechanically walked off the stage. Izuku had watched the battle from the stairs in the stands, mouth slightly agape at how quickly it had finished. Sure, he had ways to handle Ida but his speed was certainly nothing to scoff at. The next fight lasted significantly longer. Kaken was fighting a natural buff to his quirk Kirishima as Strongeny. At first, the explosive teen had C. C. Kylie thrown a few powerful explosions at the boy, but no damage was incurred as Kirishima strongened his body to take the hits. Kirishima was a natural tank his ability lent him to being the perfect shield in battle and extremely effective against quirks, such as the one that Kaken had. However, Kaken was fierce and refused to back. Even on the defense, slowly being backed out of the rink, Izuku could tell that the boy was observing and calculating his follow-up move. As the two neared the edge of the rink, the blonde boy attacked, his explosion causing damage for the first time. It seemed that Kirishima was unable to hold up his strongening for long periods of time when he was actively on the offense. This, of course, was a major downfall when you didn't immediately take down your opponent. He would need to work on quirk stamina training and accuracy. Damn, 
He was starting to sound like a teacher. Was he hanging around with the staff too much? Izuku shook his head to clear his thoughts and continued on his way to the preparation room. The next battle between Todoroki and Takoyami was not one he should be watching. If Todoroki used his flames, it might just set Izuku off, and he couldn't have that. He refused to break down again. Underscore 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 Aizawa had a feeling that the following fight would not go quite as he had originally thought when he observed the two boys walking onto the stage. Takoyami looked as calm as he always did, though a nervous jitter seemed to expel from dark shadow. Todoroki, on the other hand, looked murderous. The dual-colored boy could easily take down dark shadow with his left side. But Aizawa suddenly got the sense that Todoroki was going to adamantly refuse to use his fire, just as he had in the previous round, and just as he had during class a few times. Was it because he had burned Izuku's team? Or was it something else? The two boys squared off and Dark Shadow immediately went on the offense. Todorkoi blocked himself with an ice wall and then coated the entire arena ground below him. Takoyami stumbled at the sudden lack of grip below his feet. Dark Shadow was still attacking, however. Todoroki used the ice to skate to the side, resembling a trick that Ashido had used in one of their previous training exercises. He used the skating technique to evade the shadow circling the ring and calling on his ice once more. The structure that was made this time was extremely thin, the sunlight glinting off of the clear ice in blinding rays. Dark shadow shrunk back from the light. Takoyami, who was now immobilized from the slippery ice beneath his feet, could do little against the sudden barrage of attacks coming from the other boy, driving him and dark shadow back. In the end, Todoroki managed to push the bird-headed boy out of the ring. The crowd rose up with a great cheer as Todoroki was declared the victor. But the boy did nothing more than walk glumly off the stage. Aizawa sighed. Why was it always his students who ended up with the emotional and behavioral problems? Underscore 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 Izuku's stomach churned. He could already see how the following battle battle would play out. If Izuku and Hitoshi fought, Izuku would win. And now, after hearing Yamade-sensei's confirmation of Todoroki's win, Izuku was guaranteed to fight the dual-quirked boy in the next round. He would be screwed against the boy's fire. Even if by some miracle the boy didn't use that side of his quirk, and Izuku managed to pull a win, Izuku would most likely face Bakugu after the fact. Bakugu would destroy him, no questions asked. Izuku could take on cake and just fine in a setting with places to hide but one-on-one -on -one in the middle of an arena Izuku would most certainly lose. Should he win against Shinsu, only to fail, what would be the point? Other than his battle against Izuku, Shinsu actually had a chance. Very few of the competitors knew of his quirk. He could catch them by surprise. He'd also become much more skilled at hand-to-hand. -hand. Would it be right to steal that chance out from under the other boy? Izuku was already in the hero course. Shinsu was not. But Shinsu could be. Shinsu should be. With his mind made up, and the signal to enter the stage called, Izuku walked forward, pulling Deku towards the forefront of his mind. Shinsu's face was impassive as he scaled the steps opposing Izuku. Don't you dare go easy on me. Shinsu warned the curly-haired boy when they reached the center of the court. I won't forgive you if you do. I won't. Izuku responds firmly, his gut churning once more. Was what he just said a lie? No, it wouldn't be. He would show Shinsu the respect he deserved and win. He just wouldn't go through with the time. Shinsu nods his head and readies his stance. At the whistle both boys are immediately sparring with each other. Shinsu taunts Izuku the entire time, trying to get the boy to speak, but to no avail. After the countless hours they spent training together, both boys are familiar with the other's moves and dodge easily. 
I can use this to my advantage. Deku thinks to himself. The freckled-faced boy jumps away from Shinsu's onslaught of attacks and regroups, picturing the fighting styles of the hero course students that he had been watching for weeks. When the two make contact again, Shinsu is visibly thrown off guard by the sudden shift in Deku's fighting style. Whilst the boy typically preferred a defensive technique, opting to use his speed and evasive maneuvers to move into an opponent's blind spot, Deku currently encompassed an opposing style. The boy met Shinsu head-on, keeping in his line of sight and using his greater strength to overpower the brainwasher. After dodging an uppercut from the freckled teen, Shinsu stumbled slightly. His footwork had been disrupted from the shift in the green-eyed boy. Deku used this slip-up to bring Shinsu to the ground, forcing the purple-haired boy onto his stomach, one arm behind his back and the other caught beneath his stomach. Izuku dug his face into the dirt, preventing him from speaking. We both know that I won this fight, Deku whispered into Shinsu's ear. We both know that there are still a lot of things for you to work on before you can beat me. Shinsu struggled under his grip, trying to at least turn his head to reply, but Deku held him still. If Midoriya can hold Shinsu for 30 seconds, the fight is his. Yamade sensei shouted loudly throughout the stadium. We also both know that I have no chance in winning the rest of this festival. I know I told you I would do my best and I have. I've won this battle, but it would be stupid of me to fight the rest of the war. I'm already partially in the hero course. You deserve a chance, Hitoshi, said Izuku in a hurried whisper. The purple-haired boy jolted at the words and the meaning behind them. I'm sorry. If you're angry, come try and beat me later. Deku stood up, off of Shinsu, and raised an arm. Shinsu turned onto his back and looked at the boy above him. What the FCK are you doing? Shinsu hissed. I give up. Deku stated loud and clear for the entire stadium to hear. Shinsu looked at the boy in an angry horror. No, no he doesn't, Shinsu cried out. Yes, I do. Deku moved to walk out of bounds. When Midnight refused to step in, frozen in place by the shock that the rest of the stadium was experiencing, Shinsu tackled him to the ground. Don't be stupid. Shinsu hissed. You've won fair and square. You can keep going in the festival. The purple-haired teen shouted at Deku, shaking him by the front of his uniform. No, I don't. This isn't the type of battle where I thrive. The others would destroy me with their quirks. You saw what happened in the second round, Deku called back. I won first place in the first two parts of the festival. That is good enough to show my worth. I won't chance having another breakdown and I sure as hell am not going to ruin your chance of winning this tournament. You can be angry at me later. Now ask me a question and force me to quit, or let me give up on my own, Deku shouted. You can even just keep holding me down and beating the snot out of me if you want. I'm not going to fight back for the sake of this stupid game. I'm done. You are the one who deserves to move forward. Fine. Shinsu said firmly, backing away from Izuku and taking a breath. Are you sure you want to do this? Izuku smiled at his friend, nodding his head. Yes. He stated firmly, allowing Shinsu to take control. Underscore 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 Shinsu Smirk. Well to F seeking bat. You are going to stand there and not move until I step out of bounds. You won this battle, not me. You a whole. Shinsu commanded. At that moment, Midnight stepped into the ring with a sigh. You boys are the definition of masochists. She said for only Izuku and Shinsu to hear. A seductive smile playing on her lips. Two contestants, fighting over the chance to lose. I don't think that has ever happened before. Shota will have words for the both of you, I'm sure. Shinsu looked at her, uncertainly being the only one capable of moving at the moment. The winner is, Shinsu Hitoshi, Midnight said, pressing the calm linking her to the speakers around the stadium. Instantly, Izuku was let go of the control and fell to his knees, taking in a deep, shuddering breath. What? No, Shinsu said, panicked. Midnight smiled sadly at him. 
The battle ended the moment he gave up. It's in the rules that we must abide by that choice once the words leave his mouth of his own volition. Your actions afterward proved that you did not mind control him to say it, so it counts. Izuku stood up and dusted himself off. It's F fine, Shinsu, are I really? Izuku said, his body trembling slightly from the previous mental hold. Just W win for me, okay? Anger crossed Shinsu's face, and he closed the distance between the two boys in a matter of three steps. The purple-haired boy punched Izuku as strong as he could, sending the unprepared teen sprawling back into the ground. Ectoplasm appeared in that moment and restrained the boy. He has lost. You cannot continue to attack. FCKU, Izuku. You could have kept going. You had a chance. I can't believe you just FC King give up. Todoroki isn't even using his left side. Shinsu growled out, shaking off ectoplasm's grip. It doesn't matter, Deku bit back. After him is Bakugu. I've gone as far as was safe. If I break down, if I lose my FC King sit on live television, Izuku shook his head. You deserve to have a chance. The odds of me winning this are pretty much zero, but you have a chance. You could go all the way. Shinsu growled, turned, and walked out of the stadium without another word. Izuku rubbed at his sore cheek, glancing up towards the commentator's booth. He couldn't see Izuwe sensei but had a feeling the man was glaring daggers at him too. Izuku didn't even bother going to recovery girl. A bruise wasn't worth getting healed over. Instead, he made his way to the back rooms, taking a moment for himself in a private area. He was struggling to breathe again, but not for the same reason as he struggled earlier. It seemed like the whole world was against him today. First the fire, and that lovely panic attack half of which he still couldn't quite remember. And then, the choice he had to make with Shinsu. Izuku had a feeling that he was only beginning his bad luck for the day. He wouldn't be surprised if Machizuka-san showed up out of the blue, making him leave again. That thought made him pause. That, that wouldn't happen, right? Just because he gave up, they wouldn't send him away, would they? He was technically being responsible. He was taking care of himself. There would be no reason to take him away from Yua, right? Now Izuku was struggling to breathe for an entirely new reason. FCK, today sucked. The day had started so good. He had been doing so well. Why did everything he did have to end in pain? Why couldn't he just have a single day that went just right? Was that really asking too much? Yamade-sensei's voice rang out over the speaker, calling for the start of the semifinal rounds. Izuku stilled himself at the familiar voice. His CH sent lightning slightly. I would like to welcome back to the stage the incredibly fast, overly serious Ada Tenya from 1A. Izuku could feel the wall against his back shake from the cheers of the crowd. And over to the other side, the boy who has taken third in both the first and second rounds, Bakugu Katsuki. Izuku groaned. Kaken would not like that. Introduction at all. Izuku decided to move at that point, listening to the commentary as he walked trying to find a screen or a spot where he could watch the match. Ida makes a mad dash right off the bat. Look at him go almost as fast as my mad rapping. You cannot rap, Mike. Came Aizawa sensei's voice. Maybe you've just never given it a chance eraser head, Yamade sensei called back. Bakugu is in for quite the ride. It looks like Ida is attempting the same move that he used with Shizaki. It won't work. Aizawa sensei sighed mirroring Izuku's thoughts. Wow. Bakugu has stopped this forward progress with an explosion that sent him flying through the air. Bakugu is not behind Ida. The hall Izuku was in shook with the force of a major explosion. That's a little extreme, but Ida is Aok. Stop picking sides. You are supposed to be neutral. Aizawa sensei scolded. Bakugu is on the move now, but he's running away from Ida. What on earth could he be thinking? Izuku paused, tilting his head to try to listen. Why the hell would Kaken be running away from Ida? That didn't match his style at all. What on earth is this kid thinking? Yamade sensei exclaimed. It looks like he is strategizing. How so, my dear insomniac? I already told you to cut the nicknames. Aizawa sensei sighed once more. He's making footholds, idiot. Footholds? Like, in the ground? That, that's pretty smart. Ida is on the move again and, what's this? 
He has tripped. He's also making uneven terrain. It's much stronger to go fast that way. Aizawa sensei cut in. Izuku couldn't help but smile. The strategy was pretty impressive. Ida is back up. And he is rushing Bakugu. What will happen next? There was another. Wall-shaking explosion. And the cheer of the crowd was audible. Bakugu Katsuki wins. What an amazing feat. Did you see it, Eraser? Of course I did. Just making sure. Don't know what you can see past all those bandages. Present Mike. Eyes away sensei ground. If you make one more comment to Boo. Anyway, Yamade sensei interrupted. Mind telling the audience a play-by-play -play of the last moment? I kinda had my eyes closed. The withering sigh was perfectly audible over the loudspeakers. Ida rushed Bakugu. But while he was being careful of not tripping over his own feet, Bakugu was able to position himself into a blind spot. Isn't that what Midoriya did in the first seconds of his first battle against Ashido? Yes, Aizawa responded. Once in Itis. Blind spot. He sent an explosion into his stomach, sending Ida flying into the air. Yay, ouch. Do you want me to explain or not? Aizawa sensei snapped irritably. Sorry. Came the sheepish reply. Once in the air, Ida attempted a spiral kick. But this was stopped by one last explosion to the side, sending Ida out of the ring. Wow, you caught all of that? It happened so fast. You are a pro hero, Mike. Don't tell me you couldn't follow that. Aizawa sensei said. Yamade sensei mumbled something that didn't quite transfer over the speakers. Izuku walked up the steps towards the commentator's booth. It would most likely be relatively empty, but still allow Izuku to watch the next battle. He wanted to see this one, not just listen. However, Izuku wouldn't dare go sit with 1C, and he wasn't supposed to sit with other classes, even if he was enrolled in them. He ended up having to stand. The few chairs that were in the area were filled by important-looking individuals. They looked at him curiously, but said nothing about his presence. What are you doing up here, problem child? Izuku jumped at Aizawa sensei's voice. The man was standing behind him, looking overtly bored. Oh, Aizawa sensei, he greeted, hands immediately twisting together. IJ just wanted to w watch the next MM match. Then go sit in your section. Aizawa sensei drawled. Um, I see can't, Izuku said. I, um. The black haired man raised an eyebrow at him. Anzai, is WW waiting? I, I dd don't want TTODD deal with him. HM. He made a follow me motion with his head and Izuku readily obeyed, running after the man to catch up with his long strides. You can sit here, he said, leading Izuku to a seat on the opposite side of the commentary area. It was all the way in the back, covered in shadow. Yet, Izuku could see the stage perfectly. Izuku looked up at Aizawa, running a hand through his hair nervously when he didn't immediately leave. Um, th the match is about tttos start, sensei. You h have to ddo commentary. Aizawa sensei stared for a few seconds longer before opening his mouth to speak. We will speak later, he said. Izuku flinched at the words. R, are you m mad? No. Then the bandaged man turned and left, not giving any other explanation. Underscore 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 Shinsu took a breath as he entered the arena once more. He didn't deserve to be here. This should be Izuku's fight. Izuku had won. This was so F-seeking pointless. Shinsu felt utterly lost. He shouldn't be upset with Izuku. He shouldn't be angry that the boy had listened to his mental health for once. But did he have to play Shinsu like a F-seeking idiot? It was cruel. It was F-seeked up. Izuku had had plenty of chances before their fight to tap out of the festival. Hell, he could have done so after, if he had wanted. Instead, he had purposefully lost ruining. Not only Izuku's reputation, but Shinsu's as well. Did he even understand what this looked like? Izuku had been winning. He had Shinsu pinned. Then, he had quit, completely out of the blue. 
he publicly showed weakness that could potentially ruin his future prospects. Heroes don't give up. The idiot. Wasn't it also up for discussion if he should be in the hero course? Now what? He runs away from the fight with his tail tucked between his legs. FCK. And for Shinsu. For Shinsu. He would never be seen as the victor now, even if he made it to first place. Izuku had beaten him and then had purposefully given up. He had practically held Shinsu's hand to get him to the next battle. No matter what, Shinsu would be in third place now, but he didn't earn it. Every victory he gained would be tainted. Every move would be seen as less than since his previous opponent had defeated him. There was a reason that losers didn't keep moving forward in competitions. Izuku should have just let him lose. Then he could come back next year and prove how much he had grown. That, that would have been the logical action. Shinsu had told him not to go easy. He had told him to give his all. But, by throwing the fight, Izuku had insulted Shinsu in every aspect. He had spat on the importance of the sports festival. He had shown no care to the strong word and dedication that not only Shinsu had put into this, but every other competitor too. The worst part. Shinsu was pretty sure that Izuku didn't see what he did wrong to blinded by trauma and his righteous self-sacrificing morals to understand. He probably didn't realize just how incredibly FC kept up. His choice was. He had made good points. Todoroki and Bakugu were not good matchups for the green-eyed boy. It made sense that Izuku wouldn't want to face them. But still, did he have to make such a public statement? Shinsu was glad he had punched the kid. Shinsu usually wasn't one to act on violent tendencies, but this time, while his blood was still boiling, it made him smile inside. Things were so much easier to handle once you had let out your anger a little. Plus, Izuku could have always fought back not that he had. Maybe next time he wouldn't completely disregard Shinsu's strong work. Maybe next time he would actually show that he gave a damn. Now, nah. however, Shinsu needed to deal with Todoroki. The half-and-half -half boy was standing across from him, now as Yamade-sensei introduced them both again. And then, the whistle sounded. Todoroki sent a blast of ice towards Shinsu immediately, but he was able to dodge, having already started to move the moment the whistle had blown. Moving to the dual-quirked boy's left side was the best option. From what he could tell, Todoroki had been refusing to use his fire since the second round. Guilt, maybe? Good. That would at least help Shinsu win. Then again, did Shinsu want to win if the boy wasn't trying his absolute best? No. Come on, Todoroki. Too afraid to use your precious fire? Or do you think I'm too weak to take it? Shinsu hissed as he managed to come in close, throwing a punch at the boy. Todoroki blocked, sending up an ice shield. Shinsu stepped back, watching for the boy. The dual-colored teen appeared around the corner of the makeshift wall almost immediately, sending another blast that actually hit Shinsu this time, partially freezing the boy to the ground. Shinsu struggled in its grasps, the ice cracking under his ministrations. But it would take too long. The only way to truly get out would be if Todoroki freed him. Luckily, Shinsu could make that happen. Come on, you bastard. Don't want to answer me? You think I'm less than you? He called out giving in to the anger that had been a steady presence in his CH since since his fight with Izuku. Todoroki was ignoring him, however looking up in the stands instead. Twenty seconds to get free. Shinsu followed his line of sight, finding the hero Endeavor, standing and watching the boy with an angry glint in his eye. It unnerved Shinsu. Looking for your dad's approval? Or is it something else? Shinsu taunted, noting the angry look on the other boy's face. This. This drew Todoroki's attention. I noticed you aren't using that left side of yours. Oh woes you. Did you and Pops have a falling out? Twelve seconds. Come on. Take the bait. Todoroki turned his glare on Shinsu, eyes lighting with sheer fury. Don't yo. Todoroki began before his eyes glazed over. Bingo. Hurry up and come unfreeze me. A hole. Shinsu snapped. He was released just as the final second ticked down. Shinsu breathed a sigh of relief when he realized he was still in the game. You and Midoriya are really pissing me off today. You both are acting like this contest doesn't matter. Not giving your all, Shinsu clenched his fists, glaring daggers at the boy. Todoroki stood motionless, 
awaiting another command. Shinsu almost wanted to pull the same sit that Izuku had, just to revel in the unfairness it would bring. Just to give Izuku the middle finger by not trying his best. But in the end, Shinsu wanted to be a hero. Heroes didn't give up when given a second chance. He wouldn't throw this away just to be petty. Well it matters to me. And that's why I win. Walk out of bounds. Shinsu commanded the boy. In a matter or ten seconds, Shinsu had won. Underscore 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 Izuku did not outwardly cheer at Shinsu's win. He couldn't, not when the two boys on the ground both looked so incredibly defeated. Shinsu had let go off the brainwashing the moment his win was called. Todoroki had fallen to the ground, heaving deeply. Shinsu had paused, looking at the boy just as Izuku did the same. Most people did not have that reaction to Shinsu's quirk. Most people were simply unnerved. That was the reaction stemming from deeper problems, stemming from trauma. Izuku slid off his chair, stepping closer to the railing and looking over. Shinsu was stepping towards Todoroki cautiously, leaning down to offer a hand. Todoroki merely slapped it away, however, standing by himself, and then storming out of the arena. Izuku wasn't really sure what caused him to leave the stands to go find the dual quirked boy. Perhaps it was a sense of kinship. Perhaps it was curiosity. Either way, Izuku had left his safe corner and ran to go find the person who had originally set him off that day. It wasn't difficult to find Todoroki. He was in the break room, where contestants went to calm themselves after a fight. Izuku had just left a similar one, not thirty minutes previous. When he entered the room, Todoroki's head shot up, a glare reaching his eyes instantly. What do you want? he hissed. Izuku nearly backpedaled at the intense anger coming off the boy in waves. Todoroki had never shown much emotion in class. This was certainly a new occurrence. I… I don't really know. Izuku whispered. Then get out, Todoroki yelled. Izuku flinched. And a no. His voice wavered pitifully. Todoroki snorted. The two stared. One minute. Two minutes. Three minutes. And neither said a word. Are you just going to stand there all day? Todoroki asked. Voice much quieter now. Izuku moved to the table where the boy sat, taking a seat across from him. Why? Didn't you use your fire? Izuku asked at long last. Inklings of Deku coming to the forefront. Todoroki sneered. I don't use my left side in combat. I won't give him that victory. Izuku couldn't stop the question from showing on his face. You oosed it against MME in the second round. He stuttered, pushing the vivid memories away from his mind. Todoroki stilled at his words, looking down at his hands. I'm sorry, he said. Are you okay? Did it scar? Izuku presented his hands and arms. Only a small scar remained on his left palm. Barely noticeable unless you knew to look for it. I… I shouldn't have lost control like that. I'm usually good at keeping that side back. Todoroki said softly. Izuku tilted his head. Maybe that's why you struggled to control it once it was let out. He said. Both boys fell into silence once more. Why are you here, Midoriya? Todoroki asked with a sigh. Izuku shifted in his seat uncomfortably. I, I saw how you are reacted to Shinsu's quick work. Yeah, everyone did. I, I don't react well, I either, Izuku said. D. W. W. worry though, and no one W will think much of yet. You D D didn't react and nearly as B bad as you C C could have. I've C come out of it as C screaming B B before. Todoroki averted his gaze, not looking at Izuku. Once more, silence fell. You never answered my F first question, Izuku murmured. I, Todoroki stopped. Why should I tell you? Because, I am might be able to understand, Izuku replied softly. ISS saw your F face when you looked at HM. At Endeavor. Todoroki tensed once more, eyeing Izuku cautiously. Have you ever heard of quirk marriages? He finally asked. The green-eyed boy jolted at the question, not expecting it. 
Yeah, I have. B but. They are illegal. Like you said in class on Wednesday. Popular pro heroes get away with a lot of illegal things. Izuku's mind started running at top speed. Was Todoroki suggesting that his father had arranged a quirk marriage? Why on earth would the man need to do such a thing? What was the point? Endeavor was plenty powerful. His offspring would most likely be as well regardless of the mother's genes. What was the goal? Apparently, Izuku had muttered these things as Todoroki had snorted once again. The goal? The goal was to breed the most powerful child he could manage. The goal was to make an offspring capable of taking the number one hero spot away from all might. And what? He thought that he did that through you. Todoroki shrugged. I have a perfect mix of their quirks. So you aren't using your left side out of spite? Deku had made a full appearance now. Anger bubbling in his CH sent at the thought that Todoroki would refuse a quirk over something that seemed so trivial. So what if the marriage was arranged? He had both parents. He had money. He had a fantastic quirk and a solid foundation. So, his father pushed him when he was younger. So what? Don't. The Izuku side of his mind whispered. You never know what happens behind closed doors. You don't know what he's been through. Don't judge his struggles without even knowing what they are. You don't know what he's been through. You don't know what he is still going home to. The Deku side quieted from these thoughts. Tadaroki had gone quiet again, looking down at the table, not moving a centimeter. In every memory I have of my mother, I only see her crying, he said softly. I remember how she called my left side unbearable before she poured boiling water over my face. Now it was Deku's turn to look down at the table. The Izuku side had been right to scold him. My father led her to that. My father led her to the brink of insanity. So, yes, I decided not to use the left side out of spite. I refused to give him the satisfaction of seeing me use his quirk to win. I'll do it with only her power. I'll prove to my father that I don't need him to become great. Deku stilled for a moment, taking in his words. Rage flared in him once more. That's, that's the stupidest sit I've ever heard. He ground out through his teeth. TCH. I don't expect you to understand, Todoroki said, standing. You, Deku called, making the boy freeze. You, who has two amazing quirks. You, who has every piece of genetic luck. Think you can tell me that I don't understand. So your dad was in a hole. Two F seeking bad. Deku ground out, fighting the Izuku side of himself that was screaming at him to shut up. You aren't the only one with a city dad. You aren't the only one who has suffered who has watched their mother suffer. Todoroki stayed silent, face growing stony as Deku spoke. I would give almost anything to have even an ounce of the power that you have. Deku bit out. Anything. Todoroki seemed to grow with his anger as he seethed. He abused my mother, and then put her in a mental institution. He raised me to be a weapon. Deku stood and slammed his hands down on the table. At least your mother's alive. He screamed images of her melted flesh flashing through his mind her cold, never-blinking eyes. The open mouth, as if screaming one last time. At least he didn't burn her to death. At least he didn't take away everything you had in an instant. Deku screamed, causing Todoroki to take a step back. What are you talking about? Todoroki asked, eyes searching. Deku grimaced. I am terrified of fire. I can't be near it. I can't stand the sight of it. But if I had my father's quirk, if I had inherited his flames, I would find a way to use it no matter what. Because it would be my quirk, not his. Todoroki spluttered for a moment, at a loss for words. I would find a way past my fear. I would find a way past the utter disgust, nausea, and faint feelings to use the gift that was mine. You said you refused to use your father's quirk. You said you will only use hers, which I assume is your mother. But that's F-seeking idiotic. It's not their powers, it's yours. It's your quirk, Todoroki. Silence fell once more as Todoroki peered at Deku with renewed curiosity. The green-eyed boy ignored it, opting to fester in his anger in the continual flashbacks of his mother's burned body instead. If you don't use your quirk, you are letting him win. Not the other way around. Deku whispered. You lost because you were being a F-seeking idiot. You lost, and now you have to pay the consequences. 
Do you think your father will ease up on you now? Do you think he will see how strong you are without your fire after you didn't make first place? You didn't give it your all, and it bit you in the ass. If you keep on like this, partaking in the petty revenge, you will only hurt yourself. Todoroki sat back in the chair, eyeing Deku closely. You didn't give it your all either. Deku sat down as well. I know. You threw your fight. Who are you to judge my actions? Todoroki hissed. Izuku looked up. Me? Deku gave a short, pitiful laugh. I never said I was any better, Todoroki. We both failed today. We both insulted our opponent. Shinsu. He seemed really angry during our fight. He's probably pissed. Deku stated. He deserves to be pissed. Why did you quit? Deku looked up at the dual-colored boy at the question, his green eyes meeting heterochromatic ones. Because I was scared. Deku whispered, as if the sentence would end the world. Of the fire? Yes. Why didn't you quit after your win against Shinsu, then? You at least could have placed third. You wouldn't have hurt his pride. Deku paused, thinking through his answer. Because, he deserved a chance. Even if his pride is wounded, even if his win will be tainted by my earlier victory, he still got to move forward. He is still proving himself. He could make it all the way. Shinsu. Shinsu deserves to be in the hero course more than me, probably. But, somehow, I still get to take classes. Yet he's stuck in general studies. It wasn't fair. He deserved a shot. Five minutes until our final battle commences. All you listeners hurry back from the bathroom. You won't want to miss this. Yamade sensei's voice called over the loudspeaker in the room. Tataroki sighed. We should watch the last match. Deku nodded, and they both stood. Your father, Tataroki started. Is he still alive? Deku paused. Yes, I think so. Is there any chance you will be sent back to him? A chill ran through his spine at those words. And no, Deku said warily. I, I don't think that would happen. His sentence is twenty years minimum. I'll be grown up by then. Good. He deserves to rot. Todoroki said, face completely blank. Todoroki. Deku said. Does endeavor. Does he still hurt you? Todoroki's eyes FLC curd with something dark. Not like he used to. I don't allow him to any longer. Deku nodded, and the two stepped out into the hall.